All right, Chirag. Hello. What's up, my man? How's it going? It's going well. It's getting warmer, which is not great. But other than that, yeah, it's all going well. It's, no, this, we have, I think, one more month left before it gets, like, torturous. But, uh, but it's also it, being pleasant, right? Dude, it's good to have you here. It's so good to, like, you helped me set up the studio. And uh, we're going to talk about that later in the episode. So who would have thought I would have you here on the show as a guest? I'm very excited to have you. Thanks yeah, for coming. I feel like I've returned to the scene of crime. It all felt like it's very familiar, but I haven't seen it in a while because I've been avoiding it or something. <laughs> but it's nice. No, it's nice to be here. Thanks for coming, man. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. To have you. Oh, what are we going to talk about? All right. Well, I have a bunch of questions for you okay. because I know you just generated this report on podcasts in the Middle East and North Africa. It's mm-hmm. your second edition. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that. And I can't I couldn't help but notice as I was reading the report how it reminded me of things like the social dilemma on Netflix <laughs> and just like this dystopian world of content that we're living in, because it wasn't just mm-hmm. about podcasts. It was the impact of all these other players and how that's yeah. affecting podcasts. Uh, but for those who are listening and watching and they don't know so the reason I'm particularly interested to talk to you is because I think you might be the one of the most seasoned experts on podcasts in the region um, because you have your uh, podcast network, you host your own shows, you're a guest on this show, uh, you help set up the technical part of this studio. So I think you've seen podcasting from all the different lenses. And so curious to ask all those questions and, and your perspective, for the different roles that you play. Yeah, happy to talk about that. Yeah. So let's start off with your general kind of personal subjective executive summary on this whole podcasting uh, landscape. Um, there were some gloomy things in the report, um, and there were some kind of things that I was uh, reassured and happy about as a podcaster. Yeah. So, what's your perspective on, like, generally, like where this whole industry is going? Are you bullish? Are you concerned? No, look, I mean, I'm definitely bullish because that's that's the business. I mean, obviously, like, I wouldn't be in it. I think if if that was the case, I don't, I don't think that that's 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 what it is. Uh, with respect to this particular report, of course, it, it there was a bit of. Doom. I, I wouldn't say, well, not doom, maybe there was a bit of gloom, but not doom, rather, is what I went. Right. Uh, just because I think that's the kind of year 2020 was. And, and I think that that's something that we all have to grapple around. Uh, I think some of it will get reset. When I say reset, I mean there will be some return to the older status quo, so to speak, or return to whether you look at it from a listenership point of view or an advertising point of view, whatever. These things will happen. Yeah. Uh, but then some things have fundamentally changed too. Right. And I think it's important for us to be conscious of it. It's important for, to, uh, you know, for us to understand the impact of that. Um, and so that was kind of the, the goal of this report was really obviously centered around 2020 and right. the impact it had and what that meant. Uh, and from every as far as we could do from every angle, which is listenership patterns changed. And that was important to understand. Advertising patterns changed. It was important to understand. Publishers, um, platforms did things. And it's important to understand how they were kind of grappling with. And then, and then the creators, of course, like people like you and me and everybody else that's trying to host a podcast, run a podcast and do something in the content space, even at a larger level. Uh, needs to understand, uh, you know, what that what it meant for us. Yeah, so I, I noticed the advertising took a hit, and that's understandable. It's a pandemic, um, and that uh, I'm sure affected all types of uh, advertising across channels. Um, the one thing that is immediately felt for me like it's a requirement to some extent, but at the same time, it's a threat to podcast as it was intended to be, which is the uh, monopolization, if you want, of exclusive content for the greatest podcasts by the big content players. Mm-hmm. So Spotify is one of them. Um, and so, you know, for those who don't know, Spotify is doing all these acquisitions to buy, they bought the Joe Rogan experience and a bunch of others. And so it starts to feel like all the good shows are going to become exclusive on Spotify, which is not how podcasts were meant to be. They're meant to be a democratized, decentralized form of content. Um, but at the same time, I was thinking, well, if you're not going to get your content on Spotify as a podcaster, how the hell are you going to make some money? I mean, you need these guys to help you monetize. So it was kind of a catch 22. Like, um, you know, on the one hand, you don't want them to own all the good content, but they're the ones who are going to help you monetize. What, what are your thoughts uh, on that? So I think it's, it's obviously there's a lot of layers to this where we kind of have yeah. to take maybe a couple of steps back to try and try and piece it together. Yeah. So uh, the first way you talked about podcasting being this decentralized space. So really one of the things I think that, and, and to some extent, I think the platforms are still trying to figure this out. By the way, we're about two hours away from an Apple event that's supposed to happen that definitely has some podcasting focus that we're confirmed for, but we don't know what it is yet. Oh, okay. And it's expected to be probably a launch for subscriptions or something else, and we'll see. We'll, we'll know in a few hours. Um, so I think, the, the, I think all the different players are trying different things to see what they can do in the space. And I think one of the things that is maybe it looks weird or looks different and we don't understand this because I think we haven't done this in a decentralized space before in a way, right? So when you look at traditional content mediums, you look at your Netflixes, your, or your social media, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, they work in very centralized, consolidated fashions, right? And so you figure out 
how that system works, and then you put everything around that. With podcasting, it's quite different, right? So it's, a, it's built on an open backbone, which is RSS, and so nobody really owns that. So Apple has been the de facto for a very long time. Spotify is trying to make the move. It's one of the things about when, you, when you're talking about siloed content or buying exclusive content right. is the idea of Spotify to say, well, how do I keep people here? Because they can get this podcasting and, then, and the whole directory of what are two and a half, three million podcasts now anywhere, right? And so what, what, how do we differentiate? And so one of the differentiation is on the content spree where they say, hey, this content is only going to be available on Spotify mm-hmm. as a way of controlling that. But the reality is that um, there's a couple of things that can still happen beyond this, right? So which is you can still choose not to list on Spotify and you don't lose audience. You lose Spotify's audience, but it's not like you can't list yourself on Apple and other, other places, which is very different from a YouTuber. If you're not on YouTube, that's it. You are not, you're not going to get views on your videos effectively. Right. Um, and so this differentiation is an important thing to understand about podcasts because this is like we don't really have any parallel to it other than maybe blogging from back in the day yeah that's uh, what i was thinking yeah. about like blogging was hijacked in a way by social media correct it was and, and can we is, are, are we on the cusp of having podcasts being hijacked by i don't think so for a couple of reasons because i think that uh, what happened to blogging happened in its very early stages of popularity, which was back in the late 90s, early, early 2000s, roughly, right? When the social media started taking over. Mm. Uh, what we have, but podcasting has been around for 20 years, right? We've, we've right. you know, there's, there's a lot of robust systems in place and there's a lot of pushback from very, uh, you know, not only high, but low level creators, uh, low profile creators, sorry, in terms of pushing back against some of the things that are happening in the space, right? And then, and we can talk about that with this podcast index is a, is a great example of, something that has come out as a, almost as a pushback to say, hey, we don't want this consolidation. We're going to find a way to create an open space for it. Mm-hmm. And the reason they can do all of that is because it's a decentralized space. Right. Um, so going back to the thing about exclusive content, I think exclusive content is going to be a trend for a couple of years. Mm. Um, and I can see that. And I, I don't think necessarily there's something outright wrong with that. Although, yes, I'm against it in principle, in the sense of saying, I don't like the idea of podcasting is meant to be open. Don't do this siloing kind of thing. Right. So Spotify will basically, if you're <clears> doing an exclusive with Spotify, they'll tell you, put your content on Spotify, but you won't be able to put it anywhere else. I mean, they, by the way, they're doing different deals with different people. So that's what happened with Joe Rogan right. in particular. Right. Uh, and I know that you have, a, big, you have a, 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 a strong interest in that as to many people. because, of, because he was, I was inspired by him to start this. Correct. Yeah. Um, and so in his case, yeah, that's what they said. They said it would be exclusive. We're going to pull all the stuff all from YouTube and everywhere else. I mean, they're kind of rethinking that strategy slightly, I think. And now YouTube, some of his clips are showing up on YouTube now. So that I think they're, they're playing around with this, this right. thing. Uh, but if you look at, for example, where they did the Michelle Obama podcast, uh, initially it was like exclusive. Then now it's like there's a, it was delayed. So after 30 days, it was available on all the other podcast apps. So they're also, I think to a large degree, they're also testing and playing in the medium. Mm. I think they have a little bit of first mover advantage in the sense that they made the big acquisitions first. I mean, they started in 2019, right? right. With Gimlet and Anchor and everything else. But for example, at the end of 2020, uh, Amazon bought Wondery, which is a content creator of podcasts and, and right. very high level podcasts and very well ranked podcasts as well. Right. And again, that's again part of the openness of the podcasting ecosystem means that an Amazon can come up and try to put up a fight against Spotify. And yeah. I think once more of that happens, Spotify's edge over having, we are the only ones with the exclusive content and everybody else is, no, you have exclusive content, so does Amazon. You'll pick one over the yeah. other. I think eventually it will decentralize itself and, and you will start to see that the, maybe the value of one platform having exclusive content yeah. may not be appealing to them. It may also not be appealing to creators down the road. Yeah, the forces of the economy, as, as they do with any other industry, will, um, will create a balance between all these players. But you mentioned Apple is having the event today. <coughs> and all the other players that are not necessarily directly into podcasts, but are in the content play, whether it's you know, Netflix, Google is probably not in content much, uh, but uh, you know, Amazon has Washington Post. Uh, and Twitch, uh, and then you have, uh, obviously, Facebook has its own version of content, which is social media. My problem with all of those players being in the content space, I, I like that it's, it's, it's a love-hate relationship, because on the one hand, you need these guys to help you do things like discovery and curation, and you know, YouTube seems to really figure out what I like, and they shoot at me podcast clips all the time that are relevant. Yeah. So I like YouTube as a platform for podcasts, for example. It's an algorithm, it's good, is what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Exactly. On the other hand, I was thinking, and this is the dystopian part of me thinking here, I am becoming the person that these platforms are shaping me to become based on the content they're showing me. You know, I'm, I, I, I might have interest in football, Barcelona, for example, um, I don't know, psychology, religion, five, six things, but based on how much of, this, of these categories I'm getting from those platforms, I become more of this person. Yeah. So in a way, I'm, 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 I don't know how much of my original authentic 
myself is is being developed versus it's because of the content that you consumed and what share of content and share of attention uh, YouTube and Facebook managed to hijack. Well, you know? we, can, we can spend hours talking about this, to be honest with you. But I think fundamentally, yes, that is exactly what we're starting to see happen now. And I think a lot of it is also a slight of the side effect of the collateral damage of 2020, which is people have started realizing, wow, like we've been sitting here consuming all this content. And why is it that it all seems to be the same way? Why am I angry at the end of every day? Like this kind of stuff, right? That, and that we're starting to see now. And of course, a lot of stuff is getting debunked and, and, and all of that's happening. Right. Uh, the other side of the sort of the dystopian view, as you're, as you're calling it, is when you have this level of consolidation, then you have monopolization, right. which ultimately actually it's eventually will hurt the, the consumers, but it actually starts hurting creators first. Right. So we have all these stories of people getting deplatformed and stuff. And, I, and, and right. I'm, you know, I'm not even talking about like the big ones. I mean, we have a lot of these stories about YouTube has had uh, these conversations happen for a very long time about people who have complained about the fact that you, YouTube's algorithm deprioritizes them, doesn't let them earn enough, or eventually just kicks them out. The right wing, or allegedly the right wing. Well, I mean, the, the thing is that there, there have been so many examples of this that at this point now you're starting to wonder, like, okay, this, uh, there's some kind of pattern happening here, and maybe it's something we need to think about it, right? Yeah. Uh, and the reason is that they cannot go anywhere else, ultimately, right. because YouTube owns 99% of the viewership of video, for example. Right. And I think that's where podcasting is fundamentally different in the sense that, you know, tomorrow an Apple or a Spotify can turn around and say, which has happened, by the way, they've, they've deplatformed people mm. as well, and said, you know, well, okay, we're not going to give you, you don't lose the voice, you lose the megaphone. Right. So, so they, they can take you off the directory and say, fine, we're not going to show you in searches anymore or whatever else. But you can right. still subscribe to them if that is something you really want to. Right. We can debate the, f the rightness or the wrongness of the fact that they should have a voice and all of that. And that's, that's a different kind of, like I said, that's a debate we can have for three hours. Right. But I think fundamentally, if you want to look at it from an ideal of saying, hey, you know, we should allow everybody to be able to create. Yeah. And that decentralization allows that creation to happen. Yeah. Now, if there are individual players and platforms playing in the space, they can set their rules and they can do what they want. Now, if we don't like it, we'll move somewhere else. Yeah. And these things, at least that, that option for creators exists, right? If I don't like it tomorrow, I mean, it can happen, right? I don't like a, a change in the agreement Spotify throws at me. Right. That says, hey, you know, we want you to do X and I'm not down for that. Right. I can be like, you know what, from now on, my podcast is not going to be available on Spotify. And hey, if I'm big enough or if I, if I have loyal listeners enough they'll they'll follow me somewhere else yeah, yeah, yeah. and if i don't then then they won't and i'll have to figure something else out but the, but those options don't exist in other mediums as they do in podcasting and i think that is one of the fundamental reasons of its strength and the fact that it has been so resilient uh, despite all of that i mean you look at 2020 and we were talking about advertising a minute ago the fact that advertising revenue dropped off meant creators just started looking at memberships and mm. others other ways of monetizing it we're not reliant on the a algorithm or B algorithm, making sure we make our money and whatever, because we have options. We can we, we are empowered enough to do things with it, and I yeah. think that's important. So, so let's talk about monetization on that on that point. Um, one of the the CEO uh, of uh, Podio, I think it's called in Lebanon. Podio, yeah. Podio right? Yeah. <clears throat> I remember I read a quote uh, of his in your report that was talking about how advertising may not be the most viable revenue model for the creators in this region, at least, because, you know, listenership is growing, but it's not big enough to generate decent re advertising revenues for the average podcaster. Right. Uh, and he started talking about two types of uh, subscription uh, and transaction. Can you remind me again? Yeah, uh, it was, I think it was transactional audio on demand and, and subscription audio on demand kind of thing. Uh, I, I, the, 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 uh, it's something I'm going to expand on him or with him on, and we're going to have a longer conversation about it. Uh, he was, they've just raised some funding and stuff, so they're, they've been a bit busy. But, okay. Which is a good thing. That's of course, good. that's yeah. great, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and they've pivoted as well, I think, in a very interesting way in, in terms of the Arabic content they're creating and the Arabic distribution they're they're doing with with the podcast that they're working with and stuff. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting thing, and we're looking at ways in which we can work together. Right. Um, the idea, I think, that you know, I, I, if not only in this region, but I think advertising in general is is a model, and it should be treated as such. I think. Yeah. Um, it's just that traditionally that's the one we've seen, that's the one we know, and so on. But we're starting to see what you can largely call the creator economy, right, the, as, a, as a larger uh, topic, Yeah. Uh, really starting to flourish. Uh, and again, 2020 has been a, an interesting impetus. So you look yeah. at your sub-stacks of the world, right, and, and what that's doing for people directly monetizing their relationship with their audience over just saying, I'm just going to find a sponsor and then, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a more honest way of... Um, having this contract with your listener is like if you're if you like my content, I'm not gonna hijack your attention. Or uh, you know the equivalent of clickbait is watchbait. You know, for, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> On Facebook, uh, I've recently noticed there's a lot of those videos that are clearly staged. Either it's a scam or a joke or a trick that is always over three minutes long. And I 
I couldn't help but notice that these videos are always three minutes and two seconds or three minutes and five seconds. And they always look like they're staged. Turns out that Facebook forces content creators to make videos at least three minutes long so that they can monetize them. Mm. And what that led to is creators making up shit, basically, in order to uh, hijack people's attention and do this thing that's called like a watch bait. So you start watching this video and you're like excited to see what's going to happen. But it's holding the stage. It's not even honest. It's not even Mm. like genuine capturing uh, human interaction that what the video is meant to pose. So I found that to also be another way of like, come on, like, you know, all, it's just so that you can make some money off the advertising that revenue is gonna, uh, Facebook's going to share with you. You're having to go through all this kind of how do we scam the person to think this is a genuine video. And it's just not an honest interaction between you as a creator and me and as a watcher. Uh, um, and that's a kind of side effect of having the advertising model versus a subscription model where I'm going to pay you for no- knowing exactly what I'm supposed to be getting here. You know, I trust you as a creator. I want to listen to you. And here's my dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever I'm paying. So just uh, do you think people are going to pay to watch? I, I'll, I'll differentiate slightly what you're saying, because I think uh, I, I don't think necessarily I don't think the advertising model is bad, by the way. I, I don't think that at all. But when I'm, when I'm talking about advertising, I'm talking about brands finding and leveraging content creators mm. to reach their audience. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a good thing. And when there is a nice brand tie-in, we all, we all enjoy the experience, right? There's creativity that comes out of it. We know that the creator... I mean, by the way, this model, in, 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 if you look in the US and stuff, especially in places where podcasting in particular, but other content is much more established. Um, you have, uh, you know, advertisers, I mean, podcasters charging a few thousand dollars for a 60 second, 90 second mention on a podcast. Oh, right? okay. And the idea is that they look at, again, because the, again, it's decentralized, nobody's forcing you to do it. And so you can decide which advertiser you want to sign up with and which one you don't. And there, there are yeah. all of these other, there's a little bit of creative control here. But the idea is that if I have a show, I'll give you an example. We launched a show about motherhood out of Egypt in, in December, uh, in October last year. Now, it's, it's quite obvious, right, that, that we have an audience of mothers that want to listen to the show. And conversely, motherhood-related products and services are interesting to this audience. And so that's a nice way to monetize the show. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think yeah. I would encourage that because it's a good idea and a good way for brands to get the amount of uh, the, the awareness and, and the recognition they want. Yeah. It allows the creator to be paid for the work they're doing. And in fact, to some level, when the listener is listening to it and they go support it, they know that they're actually, they're actually helping the creator continue to create, yeah. right? So there is that relationship, which I think is both very interesting. And, and by the way, if you, if you see in the report as well, I mean, when we survey listeners, they tell us that they actually a lot of them listen to ads on podcasts. Yeah. The retention and brand awareness on, uh, for, in podcasts is very high and higher than traditional formats. Um, and again, it's because the ads are host-read and there's an intimate relationship and so on. And so... It's endorsed Violating. by the creator, by the host as it well. It becomes almost an endorsement. And so that's why creators are very careful with that as right. they bring on because they want to make sure that they're aligning with the brand well and so I on. See. Right? So, so that, that method of advertising, I think, is fine. Yeah. As, as a creator, or if you look at it as, a, as, as a, one of my clients likes to call it, like a micro business, ultimately, like you have to be diverse. So or right. you have to diversify your revenue. So you don't have to rely only on that because advertising will go through ebbs and flows and you want to make sure you're diverse. So looking at subscriptions is a good way. Yeah. The platform forcing you to do something. I mean, by the way, the same thing is true for YouTube, right? They say like today, as of today, the YouTube algorithm is extremely friendly to, let's say, videos that are 11 to 15 minutes. I mean, there, there are all these statistics that keep coming out, right? And so you, you kind of doing this analysis are based on one algorithm ultimately. Right, right. Um, so there are always ways to game those, those systems. The difference, again, is when there's choice, then you have the opportunity to do more. That's right. Now, the quality of an advertisement on podcasts is definitely miles higher than the quality of an advertisement on Facebook for all the reasons that an example I gave is just one reason why yeah. advertising on Facebook or any other social media is sort of cheap, high, sc- high volume, low cost advertising. But this is where, you know, as an advertiser, my dollars, I mean, I'm, I'm, one thing I'm hoping and I'm glad to hear that there's some optimism on that front uh, from the advertisers is that they want quality advertising over quantity advertising. And I think that's what they get with podcasts is that when you hear that your favorite host endorsing a brand, yeah. which by the way, the host can refuse to take on, but can also take it on. It creates that kind of trust and connection with the brand. Uh, and, and, and that's something that YouTube ads that, that just show up some from out of nowhere on your newsfeed will never achieve. Um, and they've created some controversy from time to time, right? Because a creator finds out that they're somebody they don't like or whatever is advertised and, and it's shown up there and they create, it has created those kind of controversies as well. Right. Um, by the way, and this is if you, if you talk about like podcasting and the evolution of advertising on podcasting, like programmatic as being a way of coming in and, and a lot of podcasters are trying to resist that because they're like, right. well... I don't want to be in a world where an ad might be dropped on my podcast. I have no idea 
what it is and so on. So they, these tussles are, these conversations are already happening, right? Right, right. right. Uh, but I, like I said again, I think fundamentally, I don't think, I think advertising on podcasts is a very interesting space. Mm. Um, well established in, in countries like the US. Out here, I think, the, like you said, between the total listenership being still on the lower side. Yeah. Um, and then also a lot of education happening with the advertisers. So then they understand that, a, you know, a single listen on a podcast is potentially more valuable because it's a user generated play and not an autoplay. Right. A and the standardization and so of what a download counts as and all that. Correct. So all of that stuff is, is starting to have its effect. And, and I think we will start to see more and more. Right. Uh, you look at, again, and this is something we talked about in the report, the 2020 doing what it did means that advertisers will want to be more cost effective. They want to see higher ROIs for the same dollar and so on. And I think that there's stuff they can do in this space, which is interesting again. Fair, fair. So listenership, that's an important one because I think we're starting to tackle monetization and, and the consolidation of distributors, uh, which might, it's a major problem or issue, but it's secondary to how can, in the region specifically, uh, more people start to get into podcasts. Like I'm a new, uh, not just a new podcaster like with my own show, but I'm new to podcasts altogether. And I, the moment I heard a couple of podcasts or watched them, depending on where I was consuming it, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised, just like a guy who uh, reads a book and blows his mind, and he can't wait to tell his friends uh, or his girlfriend or whatever about this new book. Podcasts for me, and I'm talking here not just about Joe Rogan, but Tim Ferriss, Lex Friedman, and a bunch Fantastic, of others. Yeah. Um, I geek out on podcasts, you know, like my, fi- you know, whether it's uh, philosophy or morality or quantum physics, whatever it is, or cryptocurrency, or cryptocurrency. <laughs> uh, although cryptocurrency, unfortunately, the you got to be selective about the podcasts there because they do a lot of this kind of clickbait. Uh, might as well be an advertisement for uh, for an online brokerage. No, or, for sure. Yeah, but um, yeah, more. So this actually have, there are two questions here. I, my, my choice of preference for podcast is education, like uh, literally um, learning about a topic, mm. uh, philosophy, religion, science, all these kind of things. And in your report, I think you had entertainment was the biggest segment. And I was looking around to see where, like, is it part of it? Like education or knowledge? Like if I'm reading a philosophy podcast. It came second, yeah. So that would be other news or? No, no. So, uh, d- okay. So to, to sort of clarify the... can pull it up as well so we can... Yeah, we can do yeah, that. Yeah, 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 sure, why not? Yeah, I didn't... Um, forgot that that was an option. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sometimes you forget that. Um, Help me configure this and you forgot about it. Here we go. Yeah, here we go, yeah. No, so this it. is... this uh, the, the one you're talking about but um, is specifically towards um, the, the, the listeners who said they listened to more podcasts uh, last year because of the pandemic, because of lockdowns, because of whatever, um, preferred entertainment shows. And I think that this is... It's a little bit of an outlier, not by a big deal because I think like in 2019 as well, we saw that people prefer entertainment because I think it's a, it's also a gap issue. Uh, we don't really have a lot of entertainment content getting created here, and I don't think that's limited to podcasts. By the way, I think it could be it could be beyond that. Okay. Uh, and so so there is a there is a demand for it now. A lot of the entertainment podcasts or the kind of entertainment podcasts we might see uh, in places like the U.S. and so on have to do with the fact that you know uh, a movie has come out, you've done a review, uh, you know you have a comic and he's recording a show, like all of these kind of shows that are meant to be light, not necessarily. You may end up learning from it, but they're not in that category of, as you said, education. Right. Um, I think that those are, tend to be preferred uh, because it's it's an it's an interesting space to do that. Right. Um, because I think there is a dearth of content here that that caters to that need as well. And yeah. so the demand is also, it's kind of like, man, I wish we could, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And then I think the third part is, of course, 2020 was a kind of year where there was so much fatigue around sitting in front of a screen and Zoom meetings and working from all of this stuff put mm. together. It makes sense that, and because, it, I, by the way, I mean, this is, we, we have the survey result that proves that. I felt that too. Yeah. I, I was not listening to the podcast that I was listening to pre-March 2020 in the same frequency and the same intensity as I was listening to after. Right. Because I was home all the time, I wasn't commuting for a while and so on. So I was trying to, and I wanted, I wanted to just switch off at the end of the day. And I want to listen to something that's light and, 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 and happy and, and fun and, and something I can connect with. Right. So I think that that space is interesting. And I think that it, if, if anybody's listening to this and wants to create, I would say look at that category. Right. Because I think it's an interesting place. Yeah, I'm trying to understand a little bit more from those categories. What is, I mean, podcasts compete with different types of media based on the content we're talking about. Mm-hmm. So like a person who normally reads a book or an audiobook or listens to an audiobook. Uh, might find themselves uh, doing podcasts instead of reading or listening to audiobooks. And then you have somebody that might be watching, binge watching documentaries on Netflix or maybe something entertaining uh, instead listening to this fun podcast or maybe it's a sports commentary podcast or one of those things. Um, But regardless of which one we're talking about, as a fan of podcasts, I feel like the biggest issue that the reason why people are not listening to podcasts in this region is because they haven't had the experience of the podcast. Like people are so used to just doing social media sound bites, scrolling through their news feeds, YouTubing, mm-hmm. that they haven't even given podcasts a chance 
to listen to like a 40 minute podcast or 30 minute or hour or whatever it is and then and a good one one that really resonates with them and i feel like if people do it's the same as reading a book and suddenly you picked up reading as a hobby you know, I mean, you it's, a, it's an interesting analogy that you t- when you talk about reading, because I think I think audio is like that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, if you it, for me, it's a very direct comparison of saying their words are mine, but the imagination is yours. Right. Right. And I think that you know, not having someone sitting and looking at a screen of two people talking, or any other kind of whatever it could be, allows you to create uh, in in a very interesting way. If you look at some of the documentary podcasts that get created and the soundscapes they use and the work that happens in that space, allows you to let your imagination imagine. This guy must be wearing a yellow shirt. He must be looking like this just based on the voice. And I think that that's, it's both very interesting and, 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 uh, and great in terms of creativity, but also very powerful in terms of the medium that we're using, which is audio. And mm-hmm. I think human beings, we have a lot of uh, inherent nostalgia towards audio, whether it's because we grew up, well, of course, with the old telephone, but even if you look back in history where... Radio. No, 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 even, I'm talking even before technology. I'm saying like, uh, you know, voice was the way things were passed down from generation to generation as right. well, right? So, so all of that, I think, is, is, is part of, it's in our DNA anyway. And I think that's the reason why, even if yeah. you look at sort of Clubhouse having this like exponential growth, <laughs> I know we'll talk about that later, but I think part of it is also just it allowed people to connect over audio, both to ignite that nostalgia, but at the same time to switch, do not have to look at a screen right. you know, in a year when that's all we were doing all day long. And yeah. I think that, that that has something to that. Uh, but to go back to, to what we were talking about, so, so, so yeah, I think that, that that example is is very interesting in the sense that it's my words and your imagination, which I think is very powerful in what right. it can do. Uh, and you're right that uh, podcasting can kind of be very wide in terms of what it can do. It can, it can help you with entertainment, it can help you with information, it can help you with education, it can help you with a lot of things. I just think last year was that kind of year where people were just kind of wanting to switch off a little bit. And that's why I think that's what we saw show up. But by the way, the this number two category that people were was self improvement education. Anyway, yeah, so because education is included in number two, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think because I think people were looking at, at a time where uh, you know people were looking at um, it's self help and inspirational, right? Right. Because I think people were looking to pick up skills. They were looking to learn a new skill, the ones that could uh, learn a new language. I mean, I, I know a lot of people were using podcasts for all sorts of different things right. in terms of doing that. I mean, I know people that, by the way, I'm, this is not necessarily limited to 2020, but who wanted to learn a new language and started listening to podcasts in that language oh, as wow. a way of starting to pick up and listen to the words and pronunciations. Because again, you can't do that on a piece of paper. That's I think it's interesting. I mean, I yeah, guess if somebody is advanced. not, yeah. yeah, but that's pretty cool because then you're forced to have to figure out what that person is saying. And here's the other thing about podcasts that you don't have to pay attention to the whole thing as you probably would with a book, you know, like Correct. you can passively listen and you might miss 20% of it and you're still good. Yeah. And I think uh, from a creator point, this is what we always encourage people. And it's like, just remember that people could be passively listening. So if you do like a massive statistics drop in five minutes, yeah. chances are people have not heard everything that you've said. And I think it's important to remember that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so I, so I think that there is there's a lot of power in the, in the way the medium is. I think it can do it can expand through I mean as a, a lot of different uh, purposes, as we said, um, and then the ability for like you said, a passive listening. You can do all your working out, running, and doing a lot of things. You can absorb information while doing that. Mm. Like I said again, I think I just want to remind that that like. 2020 was just that kind of year where yeah. you have to kind of assume that lot, there are a few things that will kind of reset themselves in terms of preferences and things as things start to hopefully go back to normal. Yeah, yeah. I also, so it, the other thing I saw about in your report was how Spotify mentioned that all the listenership on their podcast did not come at the expense of listening to music. So it was an additional time spent on the app. I think 20% is a number. Um and the, that I, I, it's a sample, it's a survey. I'm sure there's uh, people have different answers. Um, but uh, I actually stopped listening to music as much as I used to listen before because whenever I used to be yeah driving or in the shower or wor- working, I still listen to music because I can I can yeah focus. you focus yeah. But I listen to music less because now all those other times, like if I'm working out, if I'm driving, or if I'm in the shower or getting ready, it's always podcast in the background. Interesting. But I'm I'm like I'm somebody who is uh, who admits that I'm an information addict, so it's not a good thing, right? Because it can also hijack your ability to just chill out and do one thing at one time, and I need to constantly like be listening to something. Um, but uh, so podcasts don't compete with music or other types of content. They are they need to take out an additional piece of the attention of a human being is this what we were what the study or the spotify yes the spotify research was essentially them kind of analyzing how people spend time on their platform so it wasn't a survey by the way it was actually data based on people were actually spending time on their platform Uh, and what they found is that when when you know and i think the the sort of inference that you can take away from that piece of data is essentially that if the podcast is good and the content is good people will spend more time listening to it and carve out time for it as opposed to just saying I'm not going to listen now and I'm going to listen later. 
Right. Or I'm not going to listen to this. I'll listen to that. Kind of that the competition, right? Yeah, yeah. By yeah. the way, my experience was exactly the opposite. I listen. I ended up listening to more music last year than I did in before because before it was all consumed by podcasts, and then I wanted to chill out. And I was like, well, if I listen to things, I'm going to start absorbing information. I'm going to be wired and ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so let me look at entertainment. Let me look at music. And there were a lot of times where I, what I was doing normally would have I would have listened to a podcast. I was listening to music. I mean, it it, it was varies by people. Right. Uh, but the Spotify study, I think, is interesting in that in that because because they are someone that is trying to consolidate listening in one place oh, everything audio right that's that, that's their mission anyway um so this idea of saying hey we're in music is our push to podcasting basically jeopardizing our own push of music and they i think that's kind of so it's in their interest to say that like no it's not right? of course both these things will be profitable right in in some ways but i think that that's what the that's what they landed up finding which is that uh, about you know people figured out ways to spend 20% more time on the platform Rather so they could consume this extra piece of content than just saying that's it I'm I'm going to spend the same amount of time and I'm going to split it between to cannibalize new, on uh, to cannibalize the, the right. old one so I think that was kind of the point of it uh, I mean ultimately it's it's a study I don't, I don't know necessarily if that's what may have happened but again I, I would always caution to say like last year was I wouldn't rely you know so drastically on a, a spike of something in the last year because I think that might get reset this year right. to some extent. And speaking of like cannibalization, right? So a lot of this podcast content that uh, is reflected in downloads as the number one measure of traction, a lot of that content makes its way to social media because people are trying to promote their, their content or their podcast, so they put clips on social media. And those clips are generally like 10, 15 minutes long and they more or less kind of they choose out the best clips and sometimes it kind of takes away from a download. Like mm. I, I almost wonder like if there was no podcast material content on social media, would the podcast market be bigger, but you need the, you need one. No, I think you need one over the, I don't, I don't think you can, you can say that just simply because how else would you promote yourself? How, how, so how would you find the new audience then anyway? Right. Yeah. So exactly. So you have to rely on the discovery uh, algorithm of the big players or the word of mouth, but that's also social media. So it's a catch 22 because on the one hand, you can't grow downloads if people are going to just watch your content on social media, uh, unless you're Joe Rogan and you're big enough that you, you put a clip, but people still want to watch five hours of your stuff. I mean, if you think about Joe Rogan as well, I mean, he used to do tw tw 10, 20 minute clips on, on YouTube, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm sure if you compare it, the number of people that were actually listening to the whole show is going to be a percentage of the people that were just consuming the 10-minute soundbite. I mean, that, that's just, out, outside of the fact that that is an easier thing to do, we also know just in general that people's attention spans and yeah. want for, I mean, you know, our, our survey also shows, right, people are just saying, please give me content that's less than 30 minutes. Yeah. I don't want anything more than that. Um, and it, that's my, in some ways, I would argue that it was made worse last year than, than, than better, right? Because I think people were just like, it's... And I think even um, Stefano from Podio commented the same thing. He saw... Essentially, if they had an hour to listen, they were much happier listening to three things of 20 minutes each than listening to one one hour show. Yeah. And I can understand that. I mean, I can, I can kind of see that just in terms of how even my own attention span is right. going and, and all of that. So, I, so I, I, I don't think that that's, I mean, this is the, this, to me, it's a, it's, it's, it's a piece of data we can analyze, but I, it's not any different anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, there are, how many movies have you ruined because you watched the trailer and you're like, well, you kind of give away the story. Like, there's nothing new left now. You kind yeah. of, you can piece it together. Yeah, I don't think the trailer is like the same as the ten-minute clip that covers. No, no, but I mean, topic, what I mean yeah. is like there, there have been times when you know I, I think ultimately it's up to the creator to make sure that they're creating something that allows a tie into right. a larger thing than giving it away, right? Fair enough. So I mean, one of the things when we do when we're working on our shows and stuff is we try to pick out an interesting quote or an interesting question, and then we kind of tease it so that you say, "Hey, yeah, that's a minute clip at best, though, right? Or sorry? two minutes. That's a one. Yeah, a couple minutes clip. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but I mean, we we are exploring as well doing longer stuff, right? So we're exploring yeah. looking at doing five or ten-minute pieces where we cover maybe one or two questions. And right. yeah, of course, there's going to be a ton of people that will just be like, okay, well, I got what I wanted and I'm out. Right. But then there will be a section of people that will be like, oh, that was really interesting. I wonder what else he asked and we'll jump on and listen. And I think yeah. that that's okay. That's my, in, in terms of doing that, that's my target anyway. Yeah. But the way we look at it from a larger picture is that ultimately, if your goal is, I've created a piece of content, which can be an audio thing, it can be anything else, can be a video. Um, I want people to know about it. Right. Then you've achieved that purpose, even if he didn't land up subscribing today. Right, right. He may subscribe tomorrow. Maybe the guest you might bring on is super interesting, like myself. And <laughs> then maybe he's like, I want to hear what Chirag says. So I'm not going to stop at the clip this time because I know that anyway, right. his questions are interesting. I'm going to go and jump on the whole thing. So I think if you have, you have to also think about building things long term. That's right. And yeah. you, you can't just, you know, live off the, the, I mean, and this is something I think a lot of people are starting to realize now is you can't live off the individual like and the individual follow and the individual, you know. That's right. You have to think about it long term and say, you know, can I drive some kind of brand value? Right. Uh, can I build something that people recognize me as me? 
and and know that hey i will treat this well i will treat this interview well i will do my research i'll do all the pe- whatever you might want to stand for that's right and then if that's the case then uh, then maybe today they'll only you know five times they'll listen just to the clip and that's okay because that means that they're still engaging with me yeah they just don't have the either the time or yeah they don't want to listen to the whole thing but maybe one day they will yeah. and that's great yeah the joe rogan standard unfortunately is just not realistic nobody generally listens to 4 or 5 hour podcasts like he the ones he mm-hmm. has um but he most people don't i mean oh, tim ferris forget the, yeah well tim ferris <laughs> exactly but the people forget that joe rogan was a celebrity before he started his podcast and also he's been around for 10 years and also that was when podcast was still new in the us so he was one of the early celebrities to pick it up as a medium that's right um you look at uh, mark maron uh, who does the wtf with mark maron show uh, that was just recognized for an award as well um he said i think what's the number now is 11 1100 shows or something like that i mean he's he's been doing it for that long right? he's wow. a show week He interviews uh, some guests, whether it's um, uh, some celebrity or the comedians. He interviews lots of people, right? He's been for a long time. He has about three sponsors every episode. I mean, it's, it's, he's, he's made it uh, a wonderful space where he gets to have open chats with creators for an hour to hour and a half. And uh, I don't listen to every episode, but every now and then he, he has a celebrity that I'm very curious to hear their journey. And, and he does a good job of, of, yeah. of building that, right? So I think that there is, there's always going to be you have to kind of carve out that kind of space for yourself and kind of see where it fits and then do it from there. Um it's good to look at creators like Joe Rogan and Mark Maron and all the others. I mean or serial if you want to look at it from a documentary angle and stuff and say hey I want to be that I want to be that and and have those goals. Right. But you also have to understand that like you know I mean that those are the outliers by yeah. the way right like I mean if you look at the studies it says like the average podcast has like 140 listens or something yeah. right yeah so i mean you. right so so i and mean, sometimes this is what happens when i'm talking to podcasters and stuff and or even some of the companies that work with us and you know when i say like you know actually if you hit 200 you are you're about 50th percentile of of shows in the world so and that's I, which which definition of downloads are we talking here uh, the just download or download and played for a duration because i think there is different definitions for yeah i mean so the, the, we are working through this the, these definitions at the moment some standardization is in the works but typically what i what the ideal measurement is is being attempted is that it's download and you've listened for at least a minute to 90 seconds so that uh, we we believe that you're interested in listening to this piece of content right? right so so assuming that and just assume for a minute that that's the definition we're taking right. <laughs> then in that case the idea of um, you know where your downloads are is really a factor of so many things and what you're doing there are absolutely ways to grow that and and there are things that we can do to do that whether it's social media or there's other kind of outreach with events uh, i mean people do merchandise there's so many things people do right right But I mean, you know, for example, Zach Braff and uh, I don't know if you know from Scrubs. Right. Yeah. He started a show uh, with uh, with Donald Faison, who who played Turk on the show, right? And they basically do a Scrub rewatch podcast. It was one of my, one oh, of the one of the. Awesome. Oh, it's great! Uh, they they started it actually as a as an outcome of the pandemic because they were stuck, and somebody suggested the idea to them. They're like, "Yeah, why would we do it?" Right? And they're they're I think at season four or five now. They will just be, they do it weekly. They do a couple of episodes a week. So it's just a replay of Scrubs. Like uh, through them or yeah, like through recap them. So they, of so yeah, so they do. They, every every uh, podcast episode uh, is on one episode of of Scrubs at a time. They watch it and they come and talk about it and they share anecdotes from behind the scenes. They're they're not as detailed. By the way, the 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 Office, which is another big show, um, has at least three pretty major podcasts built around the Office at the moment that I'm aware of that I'm already actively listening to. By the way. three different shows on the office at the same time imagine that right which um i love i think i think i've seen the office like all seasons like maybe four times all, all so the, uh, so uh, jenna fisher who plays pam right and angela kinsey who played angela right uh, got together and started a show called the office ladies right where and they i mean they do breakdowns like it's, it's incredible it's like at 3 minutes and 47 seconds he broke on that scene and you can see him hiding in the corner if you pay attention like they they actually they break, they dissect an episode in that manner right uh, and then you have Brian Baumgartner who played Kevin Right. Uh, he's doing guy. yeah the big guy. He's yeah. doing uh, deep dives with every single person from the office including the casting director and everybody else. And I think it's called the office office deep dive is the name of his show. Um and and he's but he's doing behind the scenes stuff, you know. Mm. And it, it, all of these I mean, you know, so obviously the office is a show that was phenomenal in what it was in terms of and it's it's almost seeing a resurgence thanks to Netflix and stuff and and it was I think one of the biggest shows that was watched during the lockdowns. Yeah. Uh, as did I by the way I watched it a lot as well. And uh, and so I mean you know it's nice to watch that but I mean that's not the show we're creating right I I did, I was not on the office or I I have not created anything similar to the office so if I'm going to start a show that's not I mean I I look at them in terms of benchmarks to say okay what are they doing how are they interviewing what are they creating and it's always interesting to learn that 
But when you're when you're benchmarking yourself, you're going to be like, well, that's not what I'm creating, right? I'm creating something else. Yeah, everybody wants to have their. I mean, like for me, the this podcast is meant to be a hobby first and foremost because I enjoy talking and philosophizing and and just I enjoy banter and all that. Um, and I think for a lot of people, like there's just way too many podcasts out there compared to how much listenership there is. So, but I think that's okay because a lot of people just want to uh, have an outlet to blog over audio, basically, right? Sure. And now with like, um, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, I forgot the name, the new app. That was Clubhouse. Called. Clubhouse, right. Yeah. yeah. I keep forgetting that name, actually. Um, have you tried it? Yeah, I was on it quite a lot uh, between January and March-ish. I think it's going to be the most disruptive thing to podcasts, and in a good way. Like because I don't, uh, no, not necessarily. No, no I, I don't think so, actually. Because uh, Wait, when you said disruptive, how do you mean it? How many times do you find yourself in a podcast wanting to ask a question or jump in and, and debate or comment and or raise your hand and just have the option to comment? You know, like I, f- I find that alone, that feature alone is just ridiculously disruptive and good because uh, giving people a Q and A option, you know, a chance to pull somebody into the conversation is one thing that no other podcast platform allows you to do, and and that's why Clubhouse, I think, uh, you know, the only the real main difference between pod, between Clubhouse and any other podcast or audio content platform is the engagement. Part, or am I missing other features? No, no, no. You're you're right, and and I I will I'll back uh, I'll I'll take a step back for a second and say that I think that what you well, let's wrap this up in in a segment we'll call social audio. Right. The idea of having social interaction around audio because at the moment, by the way, it's it's becoming a feature very quickly, right? So your Twitter has spaces. Uh, Discord has launched a feature like this. Today, I read it announced that they've launched a feature that's uh. like this, right? Um, Facebook is talking that they're working on it, and uh, some people have done research. There's about 30 startups in Silicon Valley that have been invested in just figuring out social audio in, in models similar to Clubhouse. Right. Clubhouse has a head start, but they're you know they're losing it very quickly at this point, right? Um, Maybe Apple buys them out, and that's the announcement. Who knows? Huh? Uh, I, I, d- I doubt it a little bit, but you know, you never know. They just they did just raise a round of funding to be fair, so I think that's that's nice. Yeah. Um, I think club so Clubhouse in particular. Okay, so you you mentioned that for example the fact that you can actually jump in and ask a question being this unique feature, but here's the thing that people started realizing when they started using Clubhouse is they realized that actually listening to podcasts on demand after someone has sat and edited it and thought about what has to go out actually is pretty valuable because people digress a lot. Right. And so you have a lot of these conversations that are happening that like, you know, these guys are just talking and talking and talking. I'm like, well, you're not at the point. Like, where are you? And this is something, by the way, you don't realize when you're listening to a podcast because, uh, you know, someone has figured out that, okay, this was like this massive digression. Let's just take this 10 minute segment out. Yeah. And now we've created that. Post-production. Yeah. yeah so I, 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 I did believe at the time when we were, when initially a lot of these questions were coming, I was like, is this going to impact podcasting? I think for me, I looked at it as a social platform, as a way to grow audience. Right. Not necessarily as something that was going to impact podcasting. Other than the fact that some people would be like, well, if I could do an interview and do it live, is there value in me doing an interview podcasting show? And right. maybe that might change their decision and say, maybe I should look at a narrative show or look at something else I could, that, could be, that could be home on a podcast but couldn't be home on Clubhouse. Right. And that could be interesting. And that's a good thing, I think, anyway. I think people should think about that. But a lot of people, like I said, started realizing that it's fun to do those kind of social audio engagements with uh, people and jumping in. The, the chance to ask Elon Musk or Zuckerberg or even... Um, uh, the Coinbase CEO last week uh, questions is an exciting space, but like I said, everybody's copying it now, and you know we're going to see this. I think it's going to just <laughs> it's going to it's going to go crazy. Mm. Uh, but the idea of social audio, sure, I, I think that that is a, an exciting space. Um, funny enough, uh, my theory is that it, more than harming harming, so to speak, podcasting is going to harm events. Oh, of course. The idea of doing a panel that oh, don't yeah. require you to go anywhere and jump in and ask a question and just do it in a very simple way from the comfort of your home while you passively listen instead of being in a stuffy suit sitting somewhere. In I your think, pajamas on a couch or whatever. I think, that, I think that is actually where maybe the disruption will happen faster than it will happen there. And by the way, unfortunately unfor- or unfortunately, events are already on, on a back burner because of w- what we're living in right now and people are traveling less and nobody's really doing those kind of oh my God, you know, I'm going to fly to Texas to attend this like cool festival kind of thing, which is all kind of gone. Mm. And Clubhouse and Zoom and all these other places are places where this stuff is getting created. So right. I think that actually the, the first target or the people that should maybe worry more is actually events rather than podcasters. But I think for podcasters, it's a nice way to grow the audio space to get people familiar with the idea that, hey, audio interaction is pretty cool. You can come listen to a podcast. Uh, if you look at Twitter... They've got Spaces, of course, which is essentially a Clubhouse competitor. So tell me more about Spaces. because It's exactly, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an audio engagement as a social audio layer on top of your Twitter following. 
So uh, it's a feature on Twitter or it's, it's a, a feature on Twitter. It's not like a separate app. No, no, it's a feature on Twitter. Oh, I haven't seen it. And I'm a Twitter user. Uh, they're still rolling it out, so they haven't okay. rolled it out in a major way. I, I have access to it, but I have only attended spaces. I haven't created one yet, so I, I okay. don't. Um, uh, but uh, ultimately, it is. It does a similar thing. Yeah. I think there's another thing that Clubhouse did that's I think very interesting. Well, there's a couple of things Clubhouse did that are very interesting. One is they they really seem to want to care about creators. They really seem to care about creators. Uh, they'll recently launch a monetization feature, for example, although it's in a beta kind of uh, selected few are, are have it today. But they have a very direct relationship where you as a listener can pay me as a creator and they right. take no cut from it. Right. Oh, they make no cut. They take no cut from it. For now, but yeah. Well, no, no, but I think I think it's interesting and I think it goes to some extent for them to, they realize that if people don't create on their platform, then their platform is useless. And they have to compete on the, how much money they give the creators compared to the other platforms who take, I think 60, 40 is, is what's the? Uh, uh, no, I mean, it, it varies platform, platform, a subsect is 90, 10, for example. Um, who, who gets a 10? No, you, uh, the subsect takes 10 and you, you keep 90. So the creator gets 90 yeah. and Facebook's ads get 10. Substack. Sub that? Substack is a newsletter platform, basically, that allows creators to monetize newsletters. Right, but if I'm creating content on Facebook, what, how much money do I make from the advertising revenue they're making? Uh, so if, if they're making $10 of an ad, how much am I making as a creator and how much is Facebook making? Uh, or uh, but that's, uh, but no, but you're, you're paying Facebook anyway. That's a very different relationship, right? So you're paying Facebook for the ad. Your cost is your cost to acquire a user, which may be anything between 2 and $10. I don't know. It, it varies by the ad, varies by the project, varies by... There's a lot of other factors. But the there. content creator, how much do they make from the revenue of the advertiser is my question. So like, uh, yeah, I'm paying... Content creator makes nothing. No, there's a there's a revenue share. Oh, the revenue share. Yeah, so I mean, YouTube has the same thing as well. But yeah, those those, reven- them, yeah. Yeah, those revenue shares are much higher. Of course, they're much yeah. higher. And yeah, and so if if um, what I'm saying is if if basically if, if Clubhouse gives 100 percent of the revenue they can generate straight to the content creators compared to other platforms that are sharing that revenue. No, I, I think Clubhouse's idea, which like I said, I think uh, I think the thing that's going to work and is already working against Clubhouse is the fact that they started from a zero social graph. Right. Right. So they're not built on top of a Facebook or I mean, right. they're not another Facebook or a Twitter or whatever. Right. They're we're a standalone thing that's going to create a space. And I think the last time this has happened was Snapchat. And we know where Snapchat is today. Right. Uh, because ultimately Instagram and the others made it a feature. Right. Right. And, I, and this is not to say that Snapchat doesn't have an audience. They still do. There are people that believe in the fact that, you know, Snapchat is my little space where I'm going to create. And that's great. But they, they're not growing in, in any shape or form that they were growing before. Right. Right. And I think Clubhouse is going to experience TikTok's the same. TikTok's impact on that too. Yeah. yeah, and I think Clubhouse is going to experience the same thing. Or is all, but actually, that's not true. The Clubhouse is already experiencing the same thing. Right. Uh, where you're starting to see that people are either getting fatigued from the fact that like, oh, this is so much digression and all these people are talking about stuff and, yeah, you know, all of that. Um, and I think that, 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 I think that's, that's, unfortunately, it's one of the things that because they're not built on an existing social graph, it's going to be, you know, they had to come up with new ways to, to create one. Right. I think they did an excellent job of it. But it was always going to be on a limited time scale because t- Twitter was going to come out and do the yeah. same thing and then that was the end of it. It's, it's interesting because people want to blab and so the, they'll go on for hours on, on Clubhouse because the people want to talk, they want to engage. And you're right, now that I think about it, it might be a different experience from listening to a high-quality, post-produced podcast. Whereas, you know, I, I don't know if I had mentioned to you at one point, but we my first company was Call Out, which was basically yes, what... You, you mentioned this to me, yeah. Yeah, which is basically... So it's basically what Clubhouse <laughs> is, but with live video. Yeah. And we weren't even the first. We, our angle was that we will do debates. Uh, but then at one point, as we were pivoting, we did um, just discussions over live video, which could be a room up to eight people in a room, having a chat about anything. And people can jump in, grab a seat. Uh, and, and we didn't pick up a lot of traction, I think, for the obvious reason that people just find video to be very confrontational. And not a lot of people are comfortable having their face up there, whereas yeah. the Clubhouse, they can get away with it. Um, yeah, but also at the same time, like I mean, you, you know, you, I mean, you mentioned high produced uh, audio and stuff, but it's also not that. It's also the it's the live nature of the thing. I have to be there at the right time, or I, do, I miss out. Right. Whereas with the podcast, I mean, I can listen at my convenience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so there, there is a there is a. Value it's not recorded on, on on Clubhouse. It's not recorded, right? No, I mean, people what they're doing right now is they're recording it off of Clubhouse and then eventually releasing it as a podcast. This is a mm. different story. Yeah. But my point is, if you're talking about the interaction within the Clubhouse platform, yeah, it is dependent on the fact that I'm there at the right That's time. That's right. right. That's right. Uh, so when Elon is there, I need to be there. There's to miss out on the fact that he's talking right yeah. and that's ultimately what what the point the, the the thing is i think what clubhouse ended up unlocking was very interesting because they started with a clean slate i interacted with people i have never interacted with before yeah uh because i didn't just launch uh, i didn't follow the same people i was following on twitter right i ended up interacting with other early adopters who were in the platform uh it's an invite only platform anyway so it, it kind of still is huh 
It still is, yeah. And it created this kind of uh, thing where... Exclusivity. Yeah, I mean, more, more than exclusivity also, it was like it, it, the way the graph grew was interesting, right? Because when I got on the platform and I got, I got there pretty early in January, um, we didn't have a lot of creators here who were on the platform. Mm. So I started interacting and looking at people talking and jumping into rooms that were, you know, from Australia. Oh, well, Australia came later, but US and then eventually Australia and stuff. And I have interacted with people that, like I said, uh, my Twitter graph does not let me get there even. I see. Which I think is, is super interesting. The other thing that I think I wish and I'm hoping that people will start to learn from is the fact that uh, what Clubhouse did that I think is, is um, Clubhouse goes by rooms, right? So you come in, you see a feed that says, hey, X and Y people are talking about this, Y and Y people are talking about that, and so on, so on, so on. And so if you take the analogy of the fact that like, I like you as a person, right? I like what you have to say about crypto, I like what you have to say about entrepreneurship, I like what you have to say about uh, coffee, mm -hmm. and whiskey, and <laughs> my, my podcasting or whatever, right? But I mean, you also like football, and I'm not really into football. Right now, if I'm following you on Instagram, following you on Twitter or whatever, I have to listen to all your views about everything and decide what I want to consume and what I want to retain. Yeah, fair enough. If you were in a room about football, I would skip the room. So that's, just, that's a good Which I think is a very interesting filtering thing yeah. that, funny enough, by the way, Twitter has not picked up on that. Yeah. So Twitter's uh, attempt at spaces does not actually feature that, right? It's, it's essentially you're following the person, not the space. Yeah. Um, and so, and I think the same thing is happening. And to some extent with Reddit, I think maybe the filtering will happen because Reddit is based around topics anyway. Right. Um, so I think that is an interesting thing that I think we will see show up in other forms eventually. Yeah. Uh, but Clubhouse, I think just because they're not sitting, not having the initial social graph is a very, in my opinion, a positive thing because we're kind of tired of our Instagram and Twitter and, you know, whatever. Right. And you start fresh. A clean slate. A clean slate. But the problem is, of course, is that you're never going to be in the billions because you don't have that backing yeah. that a Facebook does. Right? When Facebook, is, when Facebook has already announced they're going to launch a competitor. We already know that. Like, it's coming. And when they come with the back of a billion people, like, it's a little different story anyway. It's always weird when you see all those very basic products or features. When I say basic, I mean too obvious to be innovative right like even uber when they were first when they first came out it sounded like too too obvious like how did nobody think about this until uber did well technically they did but it's a different story yeah but i mean lyft, like, i mean lyft came first technically right and uber just scaled it up right but yeah but yeah. i mean the fact that it took uh, was it how long was it seven eight years ago that we had mm -hmm. the drives on demand driving on demand or mm -hmm. rides on demand felt like a kind of thing that should have happened a long much longer ago and like even with this audio social audio interaction that clubhouse is doing feels like the kind of thing that how come it took that long for that to happen? Because we've had, speaking of the word blab, blab was actually what Clubhouse is on video before we started call out mm -hmm. and they shut down because of lack of traction, but they were basically Clubhouse with video. You have four people in a room chatting and discussing and people can watch and they would do even workouts on, on live video and they were doing like yoga, four people doing yoga together. So there were different use cases. And, um, and then, so what happened with blab shut down you know, Snapchat came up with the, what was what became stories, and or Instagram copied that. Mm. Uh, now Facebook is, and Twitter and every guys are copying. Yeah. But but these are basic and obvious requirements as a product uh, that that people might want to interact with the, with the creator. And it's surprising that it takes so long for these things to roll out, either as new companies or as features uh, by the big players. No, there's I mean there's so there's there's a lot of reasons for that. Mm. I, I mean the answer is obviously it's not it's not like one answer. It's not one one reason why. Um, I mean if you think about it, like. Um, one of the reasons why Clubhouse worked is because they launched during a pandemic, mm. right? So the fact that people were stuck indoors, couldn't do conferences, couldn't go out and do talks, or alternatively were fatigued because they were in Zoom calls all day. They wanted to listen, they wanted to consume, they may have wanted to be entertained, they wanted to listen to people, mm. but they were tired and they wanted something that was passive and easy on them, right? So these factors played a part in Clubhouse taking off because they were, at the time, the only one that did it, right? Right. Uh, and I think if you look at any successful business in the last, uh, how many of our years you want to you span that out, the big ones anyway, it's also a factor of timing. Facebook, like as we always argue, like Google was not the first search engine, Facebook was not the first social network, like the, these stories. The idea is that there's always a there's it's always a case of someone having to find a good way to implement it. So the execution has to be great, the right time, and it has to be at the uh, and or it has to be at the right time. One of those two things have to work for this thing to take off. Sure, yeah. And so I think that that has that's played a part in it to some, to a large degree. Fair enough. Fair enough. Cool. I want to get back to the report and also more importantly the um, <clears throat> listenership and the kind of the, the reason why. We're still a nascent region when it comes to uh, listenership. Uh, we don't, you know, it's safe to say that podcasts, the, the podcast market in general is growing. But as a region here in the Middle East, we are not where we 
can be uh, as far as people becoming podcast listeners, podcast consumers. Um, so what could be done uh, and, and what needs to be done by either by all the market participants, whether it's the advertisers or the creators or all of us as podcasters in order to, uh, you know, ignite the up t- for people to start to take on listening to podcasts as, as a thing, because it's really useful and it's really it's a format that I think people need to try before they can actually enjoy it. And, and the second part of that question is, what have some of the best podcast shows done in this region? Uh, who are they actually from your experience? Who are the best podcasters and podcast shows in the region and what made them gr- as great as they are and what can we learn from them as, as podcasters in the region to get as good as, as or even better for that matter? Okay, um, we'll start with the first part. Uh, so look, I, I think um, there is definitely an awareness issue uh, and I think we've, we, our, our surveys have shown that and, and, and a lot of other studies have shown that. Uh, the Nielsen, I, I looked at the numbers like uh, last year at some point, I think the number of radio listeners in the UAE is like 7 million or something, right? We're not seeing anywhere close to those numbers in podcasts, which means that there is an awareness issue because they are primed for audio. They're primed to listen to some kind of audio content, maybe when they're commuting, when they're otherwise. Uh, so there's an awareness issue. It's one. So when you say awareness, you mean like they don't even know that they can listen to something it's like a on podcast demand, on Spotify or, or yeah, yeah, correct. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this, but I have as well, where you're talking to people and they're like, so how do I listen? Yeah. We have to start, we have to start a conversation there, right? Uh, thankfully, what has changed in the last three years or so is the fact that I don't have to have the conversation. It's like, what is a podcast has gone away yeah. or, or seemingly to some extent has gone away. Uh, but I mean, in, in 2017, we were like, well, so what's that? Was happening way more often than I would have liked, but it was happening, right? Yeah. Um, so th- there is that awareness issue. Um, I think there is a, a definitely a feeling of um, I, I don't I don't know what to attribute it to necessarily, but I think that there is a preference for non-local content. Yeah. When I say when I say preference, what I mean is it's not that they don't want to necessarily listen to it. They, they're not aware. So the awareness and the fact that that actually there is local content discovery discovery right and it's a, it, and it is absolutely a discovery problem. It's also partially a marketing problem, right? Right. Marketing from the creator side, discovery from the platform side. Right. right? Uh, and so I think that is also a problem, right? So I've had just anecdotal conversations, but again, the survey data backs this up, which is where you were talking about like, oh, I didn't know that like people were creating podcasts here. Yeah. I didn't know that, oh, there were all these successful podcasts here. Oh, I didn't know that people were making businesses out of running podcasts here, being surprising things for people. And that's something that, uh, you know, we have to work to resolve. To some extent, right? So, so the discovery part is something that we can't figure out because the apps, Spotify, Apple, all those guys need to have a way to tell the user that actually happens to open those apps to begin with that there is a way to filter through the content. Like, I don't know if there is even a way to filter through content. I mean, you can at best search by genre and that's it. But like, I'd, like I would have never, and I'm a Scrubs fan and I'm the Office fan and I have only just learned about those two shows from you. <laughs> and these are international shows. Yes, they are. So like they're probably, uh, and thank God for YouTube because YouTube is shooting, is, is filling my newsfeed on YouTube with content that actually I would like. So the discovery part is happening on social media while the full experience is happening on Spotify and Apple and Angami and other platforms. But these platforms on, on their own are not very good when it comes to discovery. They'll just give you whatever is on the newsfeed and at best, you'll be able to find the the search by genre. And, and by the way, who still searches by genre? Like, the discovery is very bad. So the, this goes back to the conversation we talk about decentralization, right? And I think uh, this is where decentralization can be a bit of a tough nut to crack, right? right? Uh, when everything's in YouTube, YouTube controls the algorithm. YouTube says, "All right, cool. Let's." showcase this, let's do this, let's figure out uh, likes, listens, views, whatever metric we want to re- re- figure out our algorithm is based on, and we're going to front that information to you. Right. Instagram does the same thing, Twitter does the same thing. Uh, podcasting doesn't work like that, which makes things a bit more complicated. I don't think necessarily that's a bad thing. I think it's just an evolution, and it's a thing that we have to evolve and figure out and so on. Um, the other problem, I think, is that Apple has been the default, well, when I say problem, I mean, the, Apple has been the de facto podcasting app of choice for, for many years. But Apple has done podcasting in similar to we've done the App Store, which is regionally uh, done. We're in a region where, was it 90%, 80% plus are expats? I, I, don't, I don't even have a UAE Apple account, by the way. Right? You're talking about the UAE specifically, though, right? No, no, but, I'm, uh, yeah, but, but regardless, we are an expat-heavy region. 
right? right? We do have a lot of expats here. Yes, UAE more so than maybe others, but it's not like we don't have other expats here. Sure. But they're in good percentage. They're not like 1% of the population. No, no, either, no, no. Right? you're right. Double digits. Saudi or yeah. whatever, right. So a lot of times what happens is like the, because by the way, even though sometimes we get featured, we, we top charts in the Apple podcast directories and stuff, mm-hmm. I don't get to see it because my charts are all showing me US podcasts. Mm. It's just the way the regional, it's just the way it was designed. Uh, there's nobody to blame here. It's just that we have to evolve that out and we have to do something about that. And we will. And I think that, that it is something Apple I know is working on. I know Spotify is working on. Discovery. Uh, yeah, yeah, they are. Rele- relevant discovery. Relevant discovery. I think that's something right. that, that is everybody's working on. Everybody wants to crack that nut because it's, it's something that's important to them. I mean, it's a very important to Spotify that you find a podcast you like. Of course. In Spotify, it's obviously. It's in their best interest. Uh, and I, you see, again, you know, different people have taken different approaches, right? So Apple, uh, two years ago, split out what you had, a combined app on the Mac and other things to do all of all your listening, music and podcast, and said, no, you know what? We're going to have a dedicated podcast app. In some ways, that was a good thing because it meant that people understood, oh, there's this podcast thing. What's this about? And discover it. In some ways, it was not so great because you had people who were listening to music who could have been initial targets. They're lost now because they're never going to open the other app. A lot of people don't even know the Apple Podcast app is comes on the iPhone by default, right? We have that, right. We have that app on, oh, all the time. Steve Jobs announced it in 2005, oh, by Correct. the way. So <laughs> but it was part, but what I mean, he announced it in, in, as a part of iTunes, right? As, right. as this like this whole thing being the pivot around which all of your media was going to be in. Right. Apple has taken the approach of saying, let's separate these things out. You want to go to video, go to video. You want to go to music, go to music. And even within audio, like music is separate from, uh, because music has its own requirements, both audio and video. Right. Podcast has its own thing. Let's separate it out. I mean, they're going to make an announcement soon. We believe it's going to be subscriptions and other things. Cool. Right. Whatever. They're, They're looking to innovate. They're trying. Spotify is doing the same thing, but Spotify is taking the other approach to say, we're going to consolidate into one app and say, hey, we're going to do this and that. So again, you know, all of these things are going to play their part. We have mm. Angami, for example, that's based here. When they initially launched their podcast offering, they were like, no, we're just going to front regional creators. Right? We're going to focus on regional creators. So it was great for a little while. Discovery of regional shows on, on Angami was really great. Okay. Right. And then what happened is people started complaining to say, hey, listen, I can get all my podcasts on this app. But on your app, I can only get regional ones. I want to listen to Gary Vee. I want to listen to Joe Rogan. Mm, so the so Spotify Ngami, model becomes more... So Ngami was like, okay, well, in that case, well, I, I don't want to lose the listener. So let's bring in the international uh, ones. But that starts but to it contaminate. Dilutes, it starts yeah. to dilute a little bit the discovery. So, so that's fine. I mean, again, these are all learning processes. Then you have something like Podio. They're focusing a lot on original content. Right. The content that they're creating and fronting. We're listening right? on them too. You guys too, right? On Amea? Uh, What's your, that? your content is original as well, right? Or the shows that you have on your network? Yeah, they're, no, they're original. Show, what I mean, but but Podio initially, when they started out, they were they started out as a podcast platform. Now they're doing a lot of original content, mm. as opposed to content that's created by Podio. I mean, as opposed to just hosting my content, which they do anyway. Right, right, right. right. I see. Um, like like, so like what does, Netflix like, does, for example, and having some to docking. some extent. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they have other shows. They have shows that they're working on with us, for example. As in, they have shows that that we are making that they are also listing on their app, but then they have their own shows that they're creating as well. So I think we're a, lot of, a lot of us are like, hey, look, let's figure out there, there are different ways to play. Let's find out all the ways we can play and see what works and what doesn't. And Podio yeah. has had good success. Angami has relative success. Um, but Angami has also, they have other priorities. It says the Spotify, it says Apple. And right. so we're, we're all kind of figuring out where we fit in this whole chain. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, and we'll talk about, I think we should talk about the podcast index at some point. But the, the idea of the podcast index getting become this offshoot of saying, you know, all of these big players and the consolidation players are doing this. Let's make sure that podcasting stays decentralized and create something separate. So and we're building an ecosystem around that too. So I, I think there are a lot of attempts are being made at the moment, and it's be interesting to see how it goes. Uh, well, let's talk, before we talk about the most successful shows in the region and what they may have done from your knowledge and experience. But what about the index? Let's talk about the index for a second. So what is that? How can it help with discovery? Um, how and, and and let's kind of like sim- simplify it for the average person who today has their phone. How can they, through the index, get to shows? Uh, yeah, so if today, you could push, that, push that for me, if you don't mind. That would be great. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so, so today, the index, is, so it's something that the, I think the creators need to look at. The listeners, uh, it, it's not going to impact listeners in a very, in the way that uh, you would traditionally think was uh, saying, hey, I have to go and do something, right? Yeah. Uh, just like we did it, like the listeners uh, care maybe slightly less about the fact that uh, Apple runs a directory of podcasts and, and Spotify does and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. Um, the podcast index was an attempt that was started by the guy who was nicknamed the Podfather because he was the guy who initially came up with the idea of saying, hey, how about we stream audio and like content, uh, you know, to all these phones and do all of this stuff. This guy by the name of Adam Curry. 
And uh, so he's been obviously, uh, you know, he's, he's been big in that space. He's been in the media space and other things as well. And he's done a lot of things. And one of the things that he, he realized is like, you know, look, Apple is going to launch things. And Spotify is doing things and, and so on and so on and so on. And at some point, all of this stuff is going to get consolidated. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that, um, you know, we are, podcasting still remains this open, decentralized thing? Which I think is, is, a, is an interesting, you know, it's a whole interesting debate on its own. And we've talked a little bit about it, but we can get into it a lot more. And so last year when Apple kind of, I think it was partly triggered by Apple announcing that they were going to get into original content, which they've been creating, by the way, Apple has been creating podcasts that they, you know, around their TV plus offering, okay. especially, right? Yeah. Um, and so it was his idea to say, look, ultimately Apple has been the de facto directory for a very long time. They are the ones that actually a lot of developers build around the Apple directory, right? So we have uh, platforms like Overcast, for example, which is a podcast app that's on iOS. And they take their ultimate, uh, who are all the podcasts that are listed in their search index from Apple. Because Apple has had an open free API for the longest time to say, hey, you can tap into our directory and build on top of it, right? Um, it, to some extent, that's one of the reasons why podcasting has stayed independent, because Apple always gave it away for free. And so when Spotify jumped in, they were like, they have their own directory, but they can't create, a, they have to create value on top of it. They cannot just say, we are the directory now, Yeah. right? Uh, but he was like, well, what if Apple doesn't allow that anymore? Alternatively, what if Spotify creates all this exclusive content and nobody, like we, we are just becomes, Spotify becomes a new YouTube for podcasting. So podcasts get lost along but, the way. Yeah, and, and, pod, and the, the, the nature of podcast being this open thing gets lost along the way. Okay, well, that, that's a very good thing to do, you know. It's an interesting, it's an, I mean, it's, it's good that he saw that. And so he said, you know what we're going to do? The problem at the moment is that we do not have an open directory. Tomorrow, if Apple decides to close it, we lose it all. No, and uh, by the way, I do not believe Apple's going to close it. At best, if they do, they might put a paywall in front of it. But it's not exhaustive. It's not collectively exhaustive. Like whatever is on Apple might not be on Spotify, whatever is on Spotify. No, so. but, uh, but that, may, that may continue to be the case because as we talked in the beginning, uh, Spotify may decide to do an exclusive content that will never be listed on Apple, for example. I mean, that's a, I mean and Apple might do that tomorrow, right? right? Apple may decide to do original content exclusive to them. I mean, th I think this is something, by the way, we will see over the next few years because people will try to play the Netflix model Right. But I say, or rather the streaming model out into the podcasting world and see if it, if it clicks. And I think right. that there's something we'll see anyway. But the idea was to say, like, if ultimately we want to create an ecosystem around podcasting, you look at what happened with Twitter, right? When Twitter launched, the reason Twitter took off is because they were open and they had a bunch of developers developing apps on Twitter, Right. Did you know the story of Twitter? No, I, 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 Twitter. I remember the first time the hashtag came out and the first tweet by Jack Dorsey. But what sort of apps were on Twitter? I don't know. Okay, let's 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 so let's let's do this story because, by the way, funnily enough, because it, it's relevant to this conversation because Twitter actually started out as a podcasting platform. So Twitter uh, text text podcast like no no it was gonna, no it was it was actually meant to be a, it was called Odeo which O D E O. O E D O. O D E O. That was like, the original Twitter. Like a, like a tweak on the word audio, but O D E O. Right, right, okay? right. Uh, and their entire, actually, they wanted to be a network of podcasts. They wanted to be a way to create a community of podcasts streamed and you could get a feed of podcasts and, and do that. that. That actually was their original idea. Twitter. Well, it became Twitter eventually, but that was the original idea. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah, yeah. So the, the company, I think it's called Obvious Ventures or whatever, the, 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 the holding company is on top, of, on top of Twitter, right? So the investment company is on top of Twitter, rather. Uh, and so they, they actually were, were investigating this. Uh, the idea of creating a platform called Audio, which was meant to be around the world of podcasting. What they realized is that the, you know, podcasting is based on RSS, which has a very interesting backbone that allows you to, anybody can create in it, anybody can do it. And if you are somebody that's compatible with it, you can create a feed of it. And that's what they were looking to build on. They realized, what if we did the same thing, but for text? And eventually they just landed up pivoting and then that's what became Twitter. Wow, I didn't right? know that. Yeah, yeah. So they actually, their initial idea was to start a podcasting platform. They just, they just, jugged, they just jugged it because they're like, it's too open. Anybody can create on it. We can, nobody can create competition tomorrow. It doesn't work for us. Brilliant. And so they landed up creating an exclusive platform, <laughs> which became Twitter eventually. Yeah. But what, what happened when they started Twitter was that initially, because they built it on this idea of saying a bunch of people will write into a standard, a protocol. And then we will read the protocol and create a feed, right? That was their initial idea. But they said, we're also going to have an open API and we'll say any developer who wants to build an experience on top of this content, do it. So in fact, all the, the first Twitter apps were all non-Twitter owned. What are Twitter apps? Give me an example of a Twitter app. There isn't any, any left today. That's exactly the point. Oh, okay. Because they took it back ultimately. They closed off the APIs and they did all of that. Okay. But the idea was initially, so Twitter effect, twit, uh, at the time there were so many, but TweetDeck 
which is today owned by Twitter, was actually an independent app that was building an experience on top of Twitter. Okay. Right? We had a bunch of uh, image... Uh, what was the app doing? Twitter Deck? Yeah. Actually, what you are experiencing inside Twitter is what TweetDeck was doing. Got it. Twitter was a web-only thing. You logged in on the web... And then you, or, or text in the US, it was text actually. You yeah. actually send text SMS messages, and, SMS yeah. messages, right? But the idea of looking at a feed, the pull to refresh, hashtag, at all of these were developed on independent apps that were, who were trying different things on top of Twitter. Right. Right. Wow. And so what happened after a while is so that allowed Twitter to grow because it created an ecosystem. Right. There was a business reason why I would be interested in creating value on that because I would get paid, whether by development, whether by whatever, however you did it. Right. right on top of Twitter's protocol. But Twitter owned that protocol ultimately. Right. And so one day they were like, you know what, this is ridiculous or well, ridiculous or whatever, whatever the reason they decided to do it, but a business reason regardless, to say, hey, why do we have all these apps that are making money? Why are we not making money off of this thing? Why yeah. are we not developing these first party clients and stuff? They basically reduced the privileges on the API. So they had like app, like user restrictions to say like, depending on which tier you fell under, you could only have 50,000 users that tapped into the Twitter ecosystem and blah, 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 blah. They bought out, they acquired a bunch of different clients and other things, consolidated everything. So today you have Twitter as a Twitter experience. I mean, you, you, you look at it as like, oh, this is just like Facebook or Instagram being a, a first party experience. Right. But re in reality, it was, it was entirely a third party ecosystem. Fascinating, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah. How Twitter, that's how Twitter grew initially. Yeah. So decentralization by, in theory is good, but then eventually like centralization is always... But, uh, but, I, but to be fair, I mean, it, it, Twitter <coughs> was never decentralized in the sense that they, their protocol was always owned by them. Yeah, decentralization. So the, the, the idea, idea of turning version. that off. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, the idea of them turning it off. I mean, even today, by the way, there are apps. There are Twitter effect. There's TweetBot. I think there was a, two big ones. Because a couple of years ago, Twitter was like, hey, listen, you know what? Uh, we're not going to let you stream tweets. You know, for example, polling. You can you can run a poll on Twitter, right? But you can't you can't do that over the API. So if you're a Twitter client, you actually cannot run polls. You don't actually get to see the polls even. So you have to be a user, not you a have to be, no. You have to be in the Twitter app to be able to see a poll oh, right, and right. see the results, yeah. whatever. I mean, so ultimately driving traffic away from them. And in fact, there was a an attempt at an open source movement to say like, guys, let's let's plead Twitter to not turn this off because it it, it kills all of us because right. we have, we've built entire ecosystem anyway. This is a different, this is a whole, like, its own debate. But the point is that ultimately the difference between this Twitter story that I just described and what happens in podcasting is RSS is not owned by anybody, which means that people can still continue to create on it, which means that someone like, which is, I think, the point that we were trying to make, which was uh, Adam Curry and this guy Dave Jones got together and said, hey, we're going to build up an index right. that's compatible with RSS. And we are going to be the open source directory of podcasts. It's like a discovery feature in a way? Uh, not yet, but, but idea, the idea of creating an open ecosystem to say, by the way, they have open APIs. Anybody, you, me, anybody can create apps on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, by the way, people that are creating apps on it. And this ties into the whole crypto yeah, conversation we're get as there well. Next. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but the idea is that we are going to create an open ecosystem of apps so that tomorrow, if, let's say, Apple decides to turn it off, if, say, Spotify decides to turn it off, if anybody decides to turn it off, it doesn't matter. Because we have, we know all, well, who all the podcasts are. Let's say it's the independent ones. And we'll have, we will, any app that integrates with us can build a listing of all the podcasts, listing of all the episodes, listing of everything that's happened. Okay, well, but that's not, so it's very unlikely, as you said, that they're going to actually stop those shows, the, the big platforms. No, uh, yes, so. but, but see, so there's a, couple, there's a couple of interesting things that have happened because of it, right? So the first is that uh, the podcast index, uh, about a week, week and a half ago, crossed 3 million podcasts. Apple hasn't gotten there yet. Wow. So shows, you mean like shows? That? There okay. are three hundred. There are three point. I think it's like three point one or something. But there's more than three million podcasts listed on the index today. How do you go to the index? How do you browse uh, it? So you can you can actually visit podcastindex.org and you can browse through it. Podcastindex.org and you can browse through it and you can you can look up any show. You can listen to the episodes there. Everything. Okay. Because, because it's a it's a index with a web front. Right. That you can see. Uh, you can also like, create an account there and then submit your show directly there. But a lot of hosts are starting to integrate with it. So the host you are on, because I know that because <laughs> you're hosting with us, but or or, or uh, I've uh, Podium anyway already integrates with it, so you can it automatically submits your show right. to the index. So they're, they're good to know. Yeah, the uh, hosts are already integrating with them, right. so that's fine. But you can go manually and do that as well. Uh, and so they they crossed three three million podcasts last week or about ten days ago, give or take. Uh, but what the, what is interesting is that they build the index. It's done. It's 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 uh, it's already a project that's closed. I mean, they did it last year. It's all it's all great. Yeah. What they're doing now, in addition to other apps that are building on top of the index, is they're innovating on the space itself. So, for example, think of things like transcriptions, right? 
transcriptions. Yeah, yeah the, the fact the that transcript the, the transcript of the of the of the show. Right. Today there isn't already, as in prior to the podcast index, there wasn't a way to show that inside an app. There wasn't a standardized way to do that. Yeah. They've actually built the, a tag for it. Oh, cool. So if a host integrates with it and you list the transcript with it, then an app that actually shows that can actually showcase the transcript as you're talking or show a feed of it or whatever. At the moment, the way people do transcripts is they link to it. Right. That's an example. The other thing that, which I think is an interesting one that they're working on is a location tag. Right. Tagging every episode with a location. And you can search shows by location. So then tomorrow an app can be built on top of that to say, hey, show me everything that people are talking about in Karama. Oh, wow. That's, it's going to open up a lot of opportunities so for that's, startups. So too. that's actually what they're building at the moment. Is they're, they're looking and... In, they're, and they're, by the way, this, it's happening through open collaboration. Is They're putting out these ideas or somebody's suggesting to them that, hey, one of the biggest complaints we have is, yeah, it's very difficult to search for... Can you tell me all the podcasts that are talking about this region? Right? And so if if you were, have a way to do that... So that, anyway, they, they idea through it. They figure out, okay, what do we need to collect from... What, do we, what does the creator need to put in? Is latitude, longitude, whether it's a location a pin, a Google Maps, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then let's ideate through that, figure out a standard and say, fine, we launched it. Now, any app that builds on top of that means that they can also list the location. In fact, there is a there is an app that is essentially building a location-aware podcast list. Pretty cool. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of innovation that's happening around that space. Nice. I've had a couple of conversations with them. I've thrown them a comment and said, like, oh, you know, I think what would be really interesting for me as a as a creator of shows, but also as a publisher and someone that's working with a lot of people, yeah. this information would be super interesting for me. And they're like, okay, cool. Like, we'll, we'll feed that into this um, open case that we've got around this topic and then we'll yeah. idea through it and figure out a way to implement it. Okay, cool. Very so cool. That's what I the like index that. is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm all up for any sort of innovation that's going to help with the discovery of shows and the uh, relevance of what I'm looking for and, and also having it as a backup option. That's, that's, that's always good to have. They have committed to having the podcast index for free forever. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. No, so great. Adam, by the way, he has a really great episode with the Joe Rogan. It was his yes. f- Joe Rogan's first episode with Adam in his new studio in, his in Texas. New studio. Yep. Right. Yeah. yeah it's so a great it's episode, uh, actually. But there was also, by the way, I think he was he was his first return <coughs> guest, if I'm if I'm correct. Right. Yeah, so he had him before. It was the second time that he came on the show as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, Adam, I, I think it's it's very interesting. I was obviously following Adam for some time now, and then with his work in the podcast index, it's been um, which I think, by the way, is very interesting. If any, if you're a creator. And you're interested in seeing what's happening in the space. Uh, so he calls it Podcasting 2.0. He's created a podcast called Podcasting 2.0 anyway, Adam Curry himself. Uh-huh, yeah. And the, him and Dave Jones, who are the two people that are building the index or, or at least innovating on it, it's, it's still an open, it's an open source thing. Right. Um, they actually do their quote unquote board meetings every week and they record it and they publish it. Oh, nice. So sometimes they digress a lot of things. And it, it, by <laughs> the way, but those digressions are super interesting anyway. Yeah, because he's a stoner, right? So uh, that's a big thing. I mean, on Joe Rogan, they were like blazing. No, on Joe Rogan, they, they were talking about it, but I don't think that's what he's doing on the on the board meetings personally, yeah. but but whatever. I mean, if he is, he is. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. Uh, but in in terms of the fact that they're, they ideate through some of the things that are that they're, that they're working on on the index to say, oh, yeah, I'm working on this, or yeah, we've had an interesting comment from somebody, and blah, 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 blah. blah. And I think that's a very interesting... Um, open source way and I think that's what the industry was meant to be very cool very cool yeah. so before we go into crypto which I'm <laughs> super curious to hear what? about what do you mean we're going to not go into crypto what are you talking about we, we are we are <laughs> I, I'm super intrigued and curious to understand how crypto and podcast can go together because I have no idea how they can or I can imagine but I want to hear from you because I haven't yet uh, f- uh, you know heard about it but before we go there mm-hmm. uh, real quick what are the w- s- the top shows in the region is it just that they created great content or did they do something? Um, I think I, okay, so to answer, yeah, you, you did ask me that question. I know it's pending. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's about creating a niche. I, I, think, I do think that that plays a big part. Uh, and that niche can be very, very narrow or very broad, and I think that's entirely up to what it is that you want to do, right? Um, I think that people tend to think of podcasting in a very linear way. To say like, oh, that means I'm going to sit uh, in front of somebody, put a mic in front of them, have an interview with them, and then cut and release it and stuff. Uh, I think that's something we need to break. Right. Right. So when you look at things like narrative shows, I think we, which are doing very well in other countries, but we don't have, we have, what, we have like five of them here, maybe. W- which are the top shows here? Like, in a, I mean, are there like success stories and podcasts that we can say in the region are the equivalent? They're not Joe Rogan equivalent or whatever. No, they're not Joe Rogan equivalent, but I think the ones that have done relatively well have figured out a way to tell stories of a certain niche that, that works for them. So you look at this, something like, let's say, Kerning Culture is being... Uh, doing documentaries around the region or around Arabs worldwide. Yeah, I think that's an that's an 
it's a it's a perfect niche that they've created and they've continued to create sure. right um even some of the stuff we've seen in terms of when we've looked at very specific areas that we can develop on those shows have done well yeah i'm curious to, uh, maybe i should you know what, now i'm thinking about it is like i'd like to actually have the host of these shows on to, to like beyond the content strategy which is finding a niche and mm. also creating good content and post production the entrepreneurial hacks that these uh, hosts and uh, show owners have done in order to get those sh- those shows as famous as they are and uh, you know as with every startup you have hacks there are things you could do in order to because a lot of people t- i was listening to um uh, sprout what, what am i thinking buzzsprout buzzsprout buzzsprout, yeah. buzzsprout. Yeah. i was listening to a video earlier when i was at the gym today and and like most people just upload the post produced um episode and they forget about it and they forget yeah. about yeah, it right yeah. and so i wonder how much work the successful shows do in terms of promoting content you know classic startup Kind of Look, I'll give you, I can give you an example, right? So we have um, we launched a show in in February called "What I Did Next." It's a show we launched on our, out of Egypt. It's done really well in terms of its launch. It's what, sir? It, it's called "What I Did Next," okay. and it's done really well in terms of its launch. Right. Uh, the idea that we um, so we're working with a company there that has it's a startup. They want to launch around audio, and and podcasts are the way that the way they want to do it, right? Mm-hmm. The show has done super well. In terms of its numbers, in in terms of anything we've done, you know, in terms of what we've and uh, we have a good scape of what a what a successful show is going to turn out to be, and and all of that stuff, and you know, one of the things that we've tried to do, and I think that it, yeah, we definitely benefit from the fact that we're a network and we have other experience. We've we've tried and tested different things, and rather we have a larger board to test with as well, is that we've always looked at trying to do, you know, every time we launch a new show, we want to make it better than the one that we did before. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there are way, many ways to define better, whether you look at it downloads, whether you look at engagement, whether you look at whatever. But the idea is saying, let's take something and say, we know that some things work and some things don't. Let's hone those skills and let's figure out how they work and do whatever that is, right? And we are, we are constantly seeing that when you are creating a niche, when you're creating an interesting angle, when you're finding ways to probe into somebody that is better than everything else they've done, um, then that's working. Right. As an example, right? Uh, one of the one of the things I mean, just as an example, right? So we we had Sami Severus on the on the episode. Sami Severus, who is part of the Severus brothers, uh, oh, you know, Rascom. Rascom and, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, one of the things that we, we were debating whether, like, do we get him? Do we not? Because I mean, he's interviewed a lot, but when you start to think about it, and you're like, okay, well, the angle we're taking. And, and that's, by the way, like the feedback we got on that episode, both on rev- in terms of reviews and in terms of social. It's like, oh, we didn't know the side of him. Interesting. So that's, a, I, mean, the, I mean, just as an example to say, look, actually, that's really interesting, right? Because how many of, you, how many of us know, and we know that he's a rascal, and we know he, he set up Alguna as a city uh, or as a, as a tourist town and everything. We know the Guman Fist, uh, all the big mainstream headlines, we know all of that. Yeah. But how many know that his, one of the things on his bucket list is that he wants to run, he wants to do a concert by playing the piano. Wow, yeah. Hey, I mean, th- those, that side of the person and, and looking at that and, and creating that is, I think it's, it's a very interesting thing yeah. to do. And actually, now that you mentioned this, right, so the podcast format compared to the mainstream news format, for example, I was tol- talking to my friend Talal Tabba, um, who I had on episode one, and you were there if you remember on crypto. <laughs> yes. We discussed crypto back when Bitcoin was ten thousand uh, dollars or eight thousand dollars at the time, and today it's close to sixty thousand. And I asked him the same questions, and we discussed the same questions that he discussed a couple of days ago mm. on Al Arabiya News. He was sitting there next to the host, and they were discussing crypto and all that. Same questions. Mm. totally different quality of answers and nuance and level of detail and granularity and and all of that so something about this format allows you to truly get uh, this honest genuine uh, angle that that mainstream will simply not ever get um uh, and, and it could also be the same information just delivered in in a much more um honest and granular way or it could be questions that you could not even answer or discuss on al arabiya that that you know at the time i remember he had discussed like his startup story or whatever it is so yeah i i guess that's what's that but really what sets apart podcasts in that sense compared to any other type of format i think that uh we have to think about or we have to we have to realize as well that uh so when you look at things being decentralized so ultimately what does that mean for a creator in the space there is no fixed format 
right? You are not, you know, we, I mean, I, I, I part joked, part I was, I was serious, the fact that, like, for example, YouTube algorithm today uh, tends to favor videos that are whatever, 11 to 15 minutes long. You, you talked about Facebook being like, okay, three plus minutes is a good space to be in, right? And those are being driven by platforms that want to do something. And we, we don't need to get in that again. Sure. But the point is, the fact that we don't have those restrictions on podcasts, right? Do whatever you want. Let's say, for example, that Spotify is f- uh, favorable to podcasts that are 10 minutes or shorter. Just for and They're not doing that, by the way. I'm just giving you an example. Sure. Let's say that is. That's okay. If you want to create something that's 30 minutes long, well, guess what? Well, maybe Apple will front you. Maybe Ngami will front you. Maybe somebody else. You'll find your audience somewhere else. That ability is something that you don't get anywhere else, which means creativity is, is unlocked because of it. That's right. right. So you can come around and say, I want to do a Joe Rogan type show. We're going to have video. We're going to have all this stuff. And we're going to create in this space in doing long format interviews. I will maybe, because I'm running a business on it and because I want to run a business on it or whatever, uh, however I look at it or what my context might be, I might turn around and tell you that, hey, uh, you no, know, but I'm not going to run episodes that are more than 30 minutes long. Or you might turn around and say, you know, we've done this conversation. I'm doing two hours, but I'm going to break them at two parts because I know that my cutoff is 30 minutes. Yeah. You do it your own way. You do it your own way. Right. And, and, you, and you work through a feedback cycle and so on and so forth. Sure. And so on. But you're not also then having to factor in an algorithm or somebody that is dictating how that, how that goes. And that means that you can unlock a lot of things. This is not to say tomorrow that, I mean, Arabia, forget them, but like the national or... A, a, uh, you have a lot of media, I mean, NPR, uh, the New York Times, they all have podcasts, by the way. Right. And they could, they could set their standards, what they're doing in print or what they're doing in other formats into podcasting. And they could, and it could work, and it could not work. Conversely, we can be independent creators and say, you know what, we think we're going to do it this way. And uh, between numbers and engagement and other factors that we might decide uh, our success story is, we can do something with it. Right. Um, when when I started doing the entrepreneurship show, uh, Tales of the Trade is the one that, that that I initially envisioned and launched the network yeah. around. Although it came later. That's the one I saw the episode you had with Lulu. Yes, that's right. And Lulu was on your show as well, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so on that show, the idea was like, you know, we've got all these amazing entrepreneurs here that don't get mainstream attention. I'm just going to interview them, right? And I'm not going to get into the franchises, and I'm not. But that was a focus area we picked. Yeah. And this is not to say that like three seasons from now, maybe we won't talk to them. Sure. Because there are interesting entrepreneurial stories in those things as well. But the idea of like, you know, finding that little niche and creating that. And I think that that's important for all creators to think about anyway. Yeah. By the way, that's outside of podcasts. That's even YouTube videos. That's even newsletters. It's everything, right? You want to figure out the way that your strengths and your audience can kind of find the synergy around, right? So fair, that's, fair, fair, that's fair. what you got to do. Cool. All right. Well, the exciting part. Now let's jump into crypto because that's the part that the, uh, for anybody that's listening and watching, I'm a crypto junkie. Um, have been that space. You don't say, really? <laughs> you, you don't. Have, you, I mean, you know, five out of ten episodes of yours are all about crypto, but I, I never picked that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I mean, if there, uh, I hope that if if people who are watching are getting into crypto and i think people go by the way i have friends i can name them and i will not do that in this episode because then they will owe me a commission of their wealth that they have generated what's wrong with that yeah well uh, i'll I'll take my money (laughs) from them eventually (laughs) no no kidding but my point is that uh, it seems that the knowledge that i've been sharing on crypto uh, whether through the podcast but probably more effectively like directly yeah just one on one or whatever yeah it's yeah. it's been great people have been getting uh, literally rich off crypto but i think it might be the time to start selling but that's for <laughs> a separate uh, discussion i'm curious to hear from you about how crypto and podcasts uh, you had mentioned it to me in a text on whatsapp let me know, uh, what is it that you're thinking where where is the synergy and what is the opportunity between crypto or blockchain or decentralized technology and uh, podcasts. Well, there's a couple of things. So for, first, uh, by the way, when you when you're talking about like convincing someone one on one and stuff, by the way, that is and again, that is fundamentally the power of podcasts, right? Sure. Uh, you you know, most podcasts are listened to with headphones on, in a very intimate setting, right? We don't we don't watch it like we're watching a TV show. We watch it like we're watching Netflix, right? And I think there is something powerful about that, persuasive about that, uh, intimate about that, right? Sure. So that's part one. Uh, part two is you mentioned because I'm gonna I'm gonna call you out on it now. Go so ahead. you mentioned that like oh I have a guess as to what you're gonna say. So tell me what your guess is first, and then I'll tell you what what I'm gonna talk about. Um, the re- monetization. I assume that it's a way to allow people content creators to make money. Yeah. So so this is actually by the way an offshoot of our conversation with the podcast index, right? And okay. Adam Curry. And uh, by the way, if, if you've heard the episode of Joe Rogan uh, with Adam Curry I on have, it, yeah, yeah. he talks about crypto and and creating yes. this value chain of of stuff, right? Yeah. 
Um, and then I think if people have been listening to your show and they've been talking about things like Bitcoin, they're kind of aware of the fact that you have the blockchain, which is essentially this uh, the system or the platform or the or the the ledger on which Bitcoin is built. Right. Right. And then one of the one of the uh, I'm trying to summarize a lot of these concepts here, but yeah, yeah. one of the things that uh, one of the sort of pain points of of Bitcoin in a way is like okay, waiting for the ledger and waiting for all of those that process to come in. And also comparing, so you compare it to traditional currency or fiat currency or whatever you call it, which is to say that, hey, you know, ultimately the banking system is the equivalent of the blockchain to some degree, not quite, but to some degree in terms of really looking at a parallel to say sure. what is the equivalent of it. But the difference in the, in the traditional currency is that I can withdraw money from a bank and I can pay you in cash and have a very quick transaction and walk away without having to worry and wait for a banking system and its processes to follow it. Yeah, that's one of them. And so that's kind of been the challenge with Bitcoin to be like, well, we are, we're thinking of this ledger and we're thinking of all this stuff. How do we work out this way where we can kind of fast track some of these things that, that are just getting stuck because right. of it? And which is what led to the creation of the Lightning Network, right. which is this whole parallel thing to say, hey, we can have one-on-one peer-to-peer transactions around this. Right. And so and, now... And other currencies that are far faster and cheaper that are not Bitcoin, like Litecoin or Cardano or even uh, Binance. So there are solutions that are inspired by Bitcoin that are not as expensive and inefficient as Bitcoin is, but um, can act, can use the blockchain technology and, and, and deliver fast and cheap ways for remittances and uh, value to be passed around. Yeah. Correct, yeah. And uh, this is where, because we talked about Tim Ferriss already, I will point right. out, I, I don't know if you watch, I'm sure you've heard the episode already, but Balaji Srinivasan, who was on uh, Tim Ferriss' episode three or four episodes ago, give or take. Who, who is that again? So Balaji Srinivasan, actually, <laughs> he used to be, I think he was a CTO at Coinbase at some point. Yeah. Uh, he's an Indian American investor, uh, but he's also been a, a tech entrepreneur and investor and so on. Right? And he's had major um, exits and uh, it's a very, very good history behind him. But also is very big on blockchain, uh, mm-hmm. big on Bitcoin rather, and, and cryptocurrency in general. Obviously, he was working with Coinbase for a long time. Say the name one more time. Balaji Srinivasan, but he's probably known as Balaji S. Balaji S. Okay, yeah. no, I haven't. So anyway, he was on, he was on Tim Ferriss' show. Okay. It's, a, it's a three and a, three hours and something minute interview, but trust me, it will blow your mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've listened to it twice already. I know I'm going to go and listen to it a third time. because it I recent? Mean, yeah, yeah, it's a three or four episodes ago. Okay. Right, give or take, okay. plus minus. Uh, and I think, um, so he's someone who's, a, he's, a, he's a massive thing. I mean, he's an investor and he still invests in stuff as well, but he's, a, and he's exited Coinbase now. I think he's still, he may be a shareholder, but I'm, anyway, this, right. is not, this is not relevant. Um, but he's, he's someone who, who thinks big about crypto. He, he really believes in the concept of the decentralized currency and the whole idea and everything it unlocks. And the, his episode with Tim Ferriss is talking about what it really unlocks. Right. And I, I recommend anybody that wants to understand what this space can do is to go listen to it because he, he deconstructs the idea of the nation state and the geographical boundaries and what crypto can do. And it's again, like I said, it's a three hour conversation by itself. So we'll yeah. get into it another day. That's a short version. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's probably edited as well. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, I, but I mean, he's, he's uh, like I said, you have to consume him. In, I mean, he's a fantastic thinker. I've been following him for, actually, I've been following him for a very long time. Most recently, actually, the reason I started paying a lot of attention to what he was talking about is because he was very bullish on India being a cryptocurrency backbone. Uh, and uh, there are many reasons. He actually wrote a post about it and he explained why he realized or why he believes that uh, India could be the backbone on which cryptocurrency is built for the next decade. Value for money, quality, talent type stuff. Uh, not just that, but also the fact that India is already a technology backbone and Bitcoin needs technology to work or cryptocurrency needs technology to work. So why not be that chain? Right, yeah. uh, and a few years ago, India had a very like, we're just going to ban this thing and not like worry about it. But they still have it. Uh, yeah, but they've, they're, 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 they're now re- figuring out, hey, what if, how will we play in this space? Right. Anyway, yeah, anyway, this I can go on about this for a very long time, but that's why I paid, I started paying a lot of attention to him, listening to a lot of stuff that he was talking about. And and by the way, if you listen to Tim first episode, he explains why he's so bullish on this whole idea. Anyway, right. coming back to this thing, uh, Adam Curry similarly is a big believer in the decentralized space and so on. So what he's been really thinking about is how do we decentralize podcasts beyond the point where someone can go back and say, no, I'm going to consolidate this or whatever, right? Take it even to the future. We've, we've created the index, we've done our bit. What do we do beyond that, right. right? So today already, by the way, you can actually send me Satoshis by just by listening to my podcast yep. on, on apps that are compatible with it. Mm-hmm. And so that's the, exactly what I want to talk about, which is this idea of saying unlocking uh, podcasts on the Lightning Network and creating this. And this is, by the way, this is something that is podcast index compatible. 
Right. So it's already built into the podcast index today so already. So when it's Adam existing. built the index, he built it such that it's crypt- it's blockchain compatible. It's Lightning Network compatible. Lightning yes. Network yes. specifically. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so is the it like the, the same as the content? So is it Patreon for crypto? Uh, no, they've they've envisioned it in a very in an interesting way. Right. So I think down the road we will see that anyway, which is the idea of saying. Can I set up a membership on that? Yeah, I kind of can anyway, mm-hmm. but I, I, there are different platforms and ways to create a node and say, hey, just paid my node. And you can do it on a monthly basis. You can script this stuff or you can create sure. a, you can, there are ways to do this. I mean, this is not, uh, we don't actually need to code it, but we can if we want to, right? right? But the idea of, uh, his idea of saying, hey, let's take the index and make it in a way that we can, we can enable podcasters to get what we want them to get, uh, just as long as they're, they're in the index and keep it that simple. Right, and so that's the idea. So the idea is is kind of the way they are looking at uh, uh, remunerating the creator is kind of twofold. The idea of streaming back satoshis to them for what you listen. Oh wow! Yeah, that's mind blowing. <laughs> let me make sure I understand this correctly. So you're saying sure. if I watch, if you listen, yeah, if I listen to fifty percent of an episode. I will automatically pay based on my listening of the... The way it's built into the index is uh, you can stream back Satoshis for every minute of listen you do. Wow. Okay, but it's not, so I, it's up to me? It's like not... Uh, you can set the barrier where you want it to be. Right. But the idea is you pay the creator for every minute that you listen. I love it so much. Oh my God, I know. No, because like it's, is it like, especially if you can automate it, right? So if you... No, it's automated. So, so at the moment, the, we're, we're just starting to see the first set of apps that are enabling this to happen. But today, the podcast index is built such that you can enable the lightning block on your on your on the index, on or on your, on top of your RSS feed fundamentally. Okay. Uh, and the moment you do that, a compatible app that understands what the lightning network is and the fact that you can do that, uh, then throws up the option to say, "Hey, you can actually stream Satoshi's back to this creator, right? And you can set where you want it to be. So and you can set it differently for different apps or for different podcasts, for example." When you say stream Satoshis, you mean send Satoshis, right? Send, send, yeah. yeah, I mean yeah, send. yeah but yeah. but when I say I, the, the reason, uh, this is the nomenclature we're using, so I'm, I'm using that. But the idea is that when I say streaming, what I mean is like as you're listening to the episodes, for every minute, you're just sending something back to the creator. Automatically. Automatically. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Right? I love it so much. I know. Because you're actually creating almost a... a, a you're creating a, a value direct, chain. Yeah. yeah. You're creating a direct value chain. Uh, the, the term value chain can be confusing because like that refers to the activities that go on from A to Z in an industry. But, but it is, by the way. So that, that's, the, that's the other beauty of this thing, which is to say that ultimately, if you create on top of the Lightning Network in a way that it creates a full value chain, everybody gets paid out along the way. Like the producers and the audio guys and yeah, so that's that's something that we can enable like down the road to say, hey, you know, if I've got something, I can pay something back, and that's one way to do it. But right. the other way to do it is, for example, uh, and this is something by the way, this already exists. So I'm not I'm not hypothesizing something. This is actually in in place today. Okay, is that there is a company uh, which allows you to use their node, okay, to receive money in case you don't want to create your own. Mm. And the way they've done it, by the way, it's a very simple system. You say you, you put in the, on your RSS feed, and there are very simple ways to do this, um, what, you, what, where, what the node is that you receive the money, right? Ultimately, or receive the cryptocurrency, I guess. Sure. And then when you receive that cryptocurrency, by the way, the, all the exchanges you do within that thing, we don't charge you for it. Right. We charge you when you want to pull it out of that node. Right. Right? Commission on transaction. Commission on transaction. But when they charge you, they charge you, I think, 5% or something. I forget what the number is now, but it's a low number. But out of the 5% they take, 1% goes back to the index. Ah, oh, nice. Very and nice. So the index makes money every time when you use this, when you use this system. The overall index, right? So that's no, like the podcast index, the one I'm talking about, the one Adam Curry created. Right, I'm just saying that everybody benefits. So the index itself benefits. In the index sense, itself benefits. Which is not just the show, right? So it's like the so overall... So the, the idea that, that... They're funding the overall index by taking a little bit of everybody and then taking it into the pool and giving it back to the index in that sense. Yeah, and, and the idea that, uh, that uh, Adam Curry, what they, they, what they call the value for value chain, right? Which is this idea that everybody who has paid... Uh, who has contributed towards getting you there gets paid out for getting you there. Right. And this is something, by the way, cryptocurrency enables. Sure. Right? It's very difficult to do that in traditional models today, but when you build on top of crypto, which is built on top of technology uh, on the Lightning Network, ultimately everybody gets paid along the way. Right. Yes, some of it is ultimately you have to create that. So these guys that have set up this idea of saying, hey, just use our public node and then we'll charge you a commission when you pull the money out. But when you pull the money out, we also pay the podcast. And it was the other reason we're here. Right. Uh, part of it is also the, their idea of doing so. 
but the idea is that say let's create everything i mean by the way i mean if you listen to the latest episode of the podcasting 2.0 adam curry is uh, he he he's at a point where he's like well you know if you have an advertiser who's on your show then every time an advertiser is listen to the listener should get paid yeah in a way right that's the the universal basic income model is kind uh, of he, so they, i mean he's 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 thinking that way but at the moment today what what the idea is is there's two like I, I actually i mentioned there's two layers the first layer is you can stream something back to the creator for every minute you listen right but obviously the the downside of a model like this means it would it would um, it would commence uh, it was compensate uh, longer shows more than shorter shows obviously yeah if you listen it, to, if you listen to the full show if you listen long. to it yes i'm, I'm assuming yeah. that so they have they have an option called the the boost function right which is to say that uh, if you feel like you're getting more value out of it whether you finish the end of the episode and you're like okay well i know i've streamed you like let's say for example 400 satoshis in the process of doing this but i really liked what you did here's 500 extra satoshis yeah. so it's a boost function so nice. th- those are the two things that are already built into the lightning network uh, built into the podcast index rather right. on top of the lightning network it's a far and better way i mean it, it's it's comparable to uh, the alternative is a subscription model or a pay to listen model it's kind of pay to listen but it's more variable so it's like you only pay to the extent that you've listened to but also the money that you're paying for whatever amount of content you've listened to mm-hmm. is not going to just straight up go to the creator. It's going to, there's an allocation that happens for that payment. Yeah. And I think beyond that also, it's the idea of saying actually, Hey, you know, it, it actually, there is a value to the content that you're listening to. And how about you pay back? Right. Right. And to some extent, this, I, by the way, I don't think this is like a substitute for membership necessarily. I think this is a, it is a supplement. Okay. Right. Uh, I, I, I mean, ultimately, it's a creator's choice. Right. right. So he can say, "Hey, I want to be lightning enable my podcast, and therefore I, you can st- you can send me satoshis when you listen." Yeah. Or I can, by the way, I can have a private podcast, right. and you can I can you can pay me five dollars a month, which you can pay on the lightning network, or you can pay by by credit card. Sorry, and it, that's yeah. fine. Uh, I, ultimately, we want to empower the creators to do the best thing they can do, yeah. or what they want to do. They have they have something similar. Uh, in fiat today on facebook and there's this thing called yy which is like the facebook of i think china mm. uh, where you pay uh, like you could be live streaming and, and i remember that example vividly <laughs> <laughs> uh, where you have somebody slurping uh, uh, noodles on in like and, and f- for some reason i remember that example because it's like who the hell wants to watch and pay <laughs> for somebody to slurp noodles and then you pay the money as you watch if you're paying s- if you're paying for every second or every minute then that 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 counts right yeah, yeah but it's like almost like a weird fetish for some people to watch somebody slurp noodles and pay them for it but today on facebook you can pay stars i think it's like the reddit has gold facebook has uh, some new thing called stars i think or mm-hmm. not stars some form of way you, you add money actual us dollars and then once you have that amount of money you can buy stars or i, th- I think it's stars and then stars are you can give stars to some unit and ultimately that's yeah. right yeah but I can see the value of, of uh, doing it over crypto um, uh, uh, as opposed to fiat uh, for, th- for for allocation purposes, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's already in. That's already live. In place. I have all my all my original shows are all already on it. Oh, you already have your shows on that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> I mean, that's a, so. So here's 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 the thing about innovate, innovating and, and finding all those solutions by people who are passionate about podcasting that allows them to come up with all those solutions, building on existing technologies or upcoming technologies that that that's, that ignites this space. And um, and I think this might, uh, I'm curious to know what else, because like there are, there's a thing called vo- uh, voice.com, which is like a social media that's meant to be um, the uh, antidote to Facebook. Because mm. Facebook has become obviously hijacked for uh, clickbait, watchbait, all those things. Um, voice.com is, uh, I don't know how well they're doing up until now. Uh, a friend of mine called uh, Salah Zaratimo, he is the CEO, and um, he used to work with Forbes. And okay. they're basically trying to disrupt social media using crypto. And I think there is something there with creating authentic content on social media and avoiding clickbait and avoiding uh, misinformation and disinformation. Um, and I think we're only starting to scratch the surface. Yeah, I think, I think I agree with you, by the way. We are only starting to scratch the surface. I think what's interesting as well is when we, talk, when we go back to those initial concepts of decentralization and so on, is the, the idea that anybody and everybody can create that's right right so the idea of the value for value chain is beyond just i mean you know i can i can expand that model and say okay well you know i'm a network of shows i work with other creators right um people can pay me as the network for stuff i'm doing right and then i figure out a way to compensate the creators 
uh, along that chain to say, hey, you know, we've received X and Y, and then I want this you. Is your cut. Yeah, yeah, this is your cut of it. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot that can be enabled this way, right? But the the point ultimately is anybody can do it, mm-hmm. which means that you don't have to be uh, set up in a certain way, register whatever those those little you know. Uh, this is not to say that like regulation isn't necessary, but that might be the case or whatever that is. It's coming. Yeah, it's coming. But the idea is that um, you know you're unlocking something that is very powerful, very customizable, very decentralized, which means. If you don't like how someone else is doing it, you can find your own space to do it and so on and so forth, which I think right. is very powerful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, today, like I mentioned, on the podcast index, there's three plus million, uh, three million plus podcasts. Right. But uh, I was checking the other day, so 160 of them are, are lightning enabled. This is like nothing. No, but still, wow. You still have 160 shows that are using the lightning network. That's, yeah, that's yeah. for me, that's so very I, good. He, here's, here's a simple example. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people will be very intrigued by this. Just by listing on the network, I've been earning Satoshis. Oh, nice! Right, just by just by listing, because I'm one in one hundred and sixty. That those are my odds today. They're not one in one three million. They're one in three one sixty. Right. <laughs> I mean. Right. So, so that's something I think that obviously it will it will work itself out, and we'll sure. do stuff around it. And I think that I'm I'm very. This is a space I'm very bullish about as well, and so I think that all of us that believe in the power of cryptocurrency and what it can unlock, and I think uh, you know with with the kind of considerations that are happening in in places like India and stuff where just the sheer volume of it is going to drive a lot of stuff that happens, right? Because if you formalize it in a country like India where you've got, you know, 1.5 billion people right. who are all, and a large percentage of them have smartphones, um, you are unlocking something that is very powerful that can drive a lot of things, which means that there is, when you look at the, f- the idea of the free market, the, mar- the market driving what you want, is that the idea of saying, well, you know, even if nobody else ever opens it up, I don't care because I have a target of 1.5 million people that I can, I can leverage, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that means that the, we will see a lot of innovation, a lot of creation, a lot of development happen on top of, off top of that. And right. I think that that is something that's very interesting just by itself. But this is something, by the way, that's already happened, right? right? That these guys have already done it. It's already part of the thing. You as a podcaster tomorrow can enable Lightning on your, on your thing as long as you have a node or you, have, or you use a service that, that provides it for you. And you can receive Satoshis as of tomorrow. Fair enough. I mm-hmm. like it. I like it a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's fascinating. It's a very fascinating space. Jurag, um, I want to, before we wrap up, is there anything that we did not cover that we should cover that I forgot to cover? Right, you should never ask a podcaster this question, by the way. You should uh, never. I, guess. I mean, we'll be, here, we'll be here for three hours if you ask me, like, what else do you want to cover? <laughs> we'll talk about coffee. We'll talk about whiskey. We'll talk about microphone. I mean, we can go on. But I will take the feedback of saying uh, podcast session should be uh, relatively uh, less than two hours, which are the, I think almost how long have we been? So have I want to. Okay. I, I do want to thank you for your time and for coming on. You no, have helped me. S- you helped me set up this beautiful <laughs> studio. So thank you for that. Uh, thanks for coming. I want to make sure that everybody who's listening, uh, who is either a, um, a somebody that wants to start their own podcast or they want to learn about podcasts about Amea Media. Mm-hmm. Um, so A M A E Y A. A M A E Y A dot media dot media. That's the website. That's also the Instagram. So you can connect with us there. Of course, you can email us if you really want to. Uh, we are working on a few things that I'll just tease today. Go ahead. Which is, no, no. But I mean, in the sense, we're working on a few things where we're, we want to see how we can enable creators to do more with this. Um, a couple of things in the work. One that is, um, I you know, I I think to kind of maybe maybe like kind of bring this all together. Right. Um, I think that the when we talk about the idea of the creator economy. And the idea that I think creators need to be empowered as much as they can in terms of enabling a lot of things. Today we're talking about cryptocurrency. We were talking about Substack just briefly, but uh, again, the idea of saying, "Hey, let's give creator or even Clubhouse, right? Let's give creators the power to figure out how they want to monetize. And if they want to go advertising, that's great. If they want to do something else, that's great. If they want to take subscriptions, that's great. But give them the tools to do it." We're seeing that kind of, I think we're, we're just kind of on a very interesting inflection point towards that. Whether you take a cryptocurrency or the fiat currency, it doesn't matter. But the idea is that you, we are on that cusp of saying, you know, all the, crea- and I think 2020 has been a huge impetus to say, ultimately, I want to find ways in which I can do something that I'm passionate about, that people are interested in, and I can monetize. Right. Right. And I think that, that fundamentally, that's what we want to, us as a company, we're trying to enable in terms of doing that i know a lot of people are interested in that space uh, and that's something where you know i think that's very interesting good stuff 
Chirag, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, it was my pleasure, uh, man. I'm very happy to be here. Can't wait to have you again. We have another session on podcasting and other topics. And oh, this, I mean, like I said, we have so many breakout points over here that I think we'll be oh, here for a while. Once we're done with the, uh, this recording, I'm going to check out what's happening with Apple because I think I'm very curious to know what the hell's going on. The, I, I know for sure there's something for podcasting but just based on sources. I guess I can call it that now. Uh, but but I don't know. I mean, sources in the sense that the people in the podcasting base have been talking about it for a while well let's see how it goes awesome good stuff thanks for coming and uh, that's a wrap thank you so much awesome thanks man